Do you have an older brother? Any older sibling? Growing up, did you idolize them a bit? Maybe fear them a bit? It's a pretty common phenomenon. When you were nine or 10, you know, someone who was even two years older, like 11 or 12, man, it seemed like they were so much older, didn't it? Like so much wiser, so much cooler, stronger, smarter, maybe also scarier. When you would wrestle, when they would pin you down to the ground, it was a bit scary that no matter how hard you fought back, you just couldn't overpower them, right? Hopefully, if you did idolize an older sibling to some degree, they weren't truly scary, just sibling scary. Not actually uh, a piece of garbage, just somebody who treated you like shit sometimes, like, you know, older siblings are so apt to do. Hopefully they were just annoying as opposed to being a a psychopath. But what if they actually were a psychopath, like a real one? What if you had an older sibling who was smart, tough, cool, funny, strong, charming, but also pretty evil? Someone who took you under their evil wing, maybe protected you from bullies, taught you how to fight but then also taught you how to rob and rape and kill. While I don't have enough source details to say that this scenario is definitely what happened with Richmond, Virginia's notorious Briley brothers, it sure seems like that this was likely the case. Maybe when you're done listening, you can chat with your older sibling about this episode. And even if they were kind of bad to you growing up, you can thank them for not being this bad. The Briley brothers were three members of a group of four serial killers who terrorized the city of Richmond, Virginia for several months in 1979. These sadistic monsters targeted men and women, old and young. One judge called their series of murders the vilest rampage of rape, murder, and robbery the court has seen in 30 years. The oldest Briley, Linwood, was the wicked ringleader. And his two younger brothers, James and Anthony, followed his lead as he led them into a hell of mayhem and bloodlust. Their young neighbor, Duncan Meekins, would also be pulled into Linwood's destructive orbit and throw his life away as well, and help destroy so many other lives. Following the same pattern as the last few killers we've sucked here, it doesn't seem like these monsters were created by horrific parental abuse. If there was some terrible home environment to blame, we don't know about it. It appears that the Briley's grew up with nice, normal parents. Same for Duncan Meekins. Until the last few years of their free lives, they also seemed to be known as good kids. Kids who would help out neighbors, mowing their lawns, maybe fix their cars. And then everything changed on January 28th, 1971. Linwood Briley committed his first murder when he was just 16 years old. And I won't give too much more away right now. This week, we'll discuss the lives of the infamous Briley brothers, how they became killers, their big murder and mayhem spree, an infamous and daring escape attempt from death row and the eventual fates of these cold-blooded bastards on another true crime, serial killing, the family that slays together, stays together edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome or welcome back to the cult of the curious. I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master guy who so wishes he could make it to the singularity within a black hole, but not be spaghettified. Guy who was so sorry for burning down the ancient library of Alexandria. Who knew scrolls were so flammable? And you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, Real quick, in honor of the store turning seven years old last week, a seven-year Time Suck design featuring a platinum number seven in the center of a classic Time Suck icon is available on a premium tee, mug, or sweatshirt, badmagicmerch.com. Recorded this in advance of the Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp. No idea how camp went. Really hoping it was a blast. I also hope that the YouTube comment section under my recent stand-up special, Trying to Get Better, continues to just produce insanity. Uh, Recent favorite comments as I record this are... From Caesar Castaneda 9631. Yeah, this is good and all, but have you ever had a vibrator keychain? <laughs> RG McReady 505 posted while rewatching the special. I think I figured out what Dan is trying to say. A certain time traveling Karen is responsible for the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. And uh, Aviers uh, 635 posted. So I watched this again, and my life is nothing like Skyrim. Not a dragon in sight. What the fuck, Dan? <laughs> so thank you. there's so many there's so many they just they just keep pouring in uh so thank you um upcoming tour dates chicago vermont rhode island buffalo new york more uh all on sale dan and you can see uh newer stuff than the special and now we're off to another true crime story a team of serial killers with the twist 
We've only covered once or twice before, uh, murderous siblings. And I think this is the first modern story where we've had murderous uh, siblings. Like the Bloody Benders were a whole family of serial killers back in late 19th century Kansas. And then there were the Vicious Harps, sometimes referred to as the Bloody Harps. You know, two brothers that may have killed a bunch of people in the late 18th century in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. Hard to separate legend from fact with those guys. But these guys, we know what they did. Uh, We know what they did in Richmond, Virginia in the 70s, heavily documented and horrific. Uh, And before diving in, a quick thank you to Dan in Jersey, you of the crazy Italian last name that starts with an S and a whole bunch of fucking letters following that, uh, who I just saw again in Richmond, how fitting, uh, for some great constructive criticism. I love when I get that. Dan reminded me to stop giving too much info away in the preview on true crime episodes, right? Don't spoil the suspense. Let the story unfold without a bunch of spoilers. And it was a great fucking note, I think. So I I have taken it on this episode, Dan. And now if people hate this episode, I will fucking never listen to you again. (laughs) But I think it's going to be good. Hail Nimrod, and let's get started. Uh, Not much set up today. Just going to share a few quotes about the overall vibe of the Briley Brothers crimes. And then we'll jump into the timeline, starting with the birth of Linwood. Ending with updates on where the major players of this story are today. Uh, The Richmond Times-Dispatch wrote about the Bradley Brothers' uh, 1979 murder spree, saying, It was a reign of terror that slipped beneath the radar of law enforcement for months. There was no sense of a common killer. The crime struck blacks, whites, the poor, and people of better means. They occurred in disparate sections of the city and in Henrico County. James and Linwood Briley killed to eliminate witnesses to the robberies they committed, but they also seemed to take some pleasure in their work. They murdered with such versatility that police initially did not see a pattern. And Warren Von Schuch, a Richmond assistant Commonwealth attorney and a lead prosecutor in the Briley's uh, murder cases, told a reporter, these people are in a class by themselves. They are incredibly inhumanely mean. They are killing machines. Somewhere down the line, there's something in the Briley's that infuriates them about weakness in other people. There was a degree of toughness. They were just tough people. They were opposed to having weaknesses of any sort. Maybe that was the one common denominator in their victims. uh, Comparative physical weakness. They were the worst kind of bullies. The ones that don't just beat those smaller and weaker than themselves. The ones that beat those people to fucking death. They generally targeted uh, older victims. Or they ganged up on someone closer to their age. Or they hurt women. Children. And again, I won't give away more than that. It is now already timeline time. The stage where all the secrets of today's great tragedy will unfold, where all shall be revealed regarding the dastardly deeds of today's vile and vicious killers. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. March 26, 1954. Linwood Earl Briley is born in Richmond, Virginia. Incorporated way back in 1742, Virginia's capital city of Richmond uh, has a metro area population of about 1.2 million people. City proper, home to 226,610 meat sacks. Uh, It was about the same when the Briley brothers were killing. Back in 1979, around 219,000 people lived in Richmond. A lot of good, notable people have grown up in Richmond, not just these dirtbags. Uh, Former suck subject Edgar Allan Poe grew up in Richmond. Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan from Richmond. Neo soul R&B sex symbol and funk wizard D'Angelo from Richmond. Acting powerhouse, critically acclaimed author Constance Wu grew up in Richmond as well. And on and on and on. Uh, Linwood and his brothers would grow up in the Highland Park neighborhood of Richmond. Full of a bunch of historic row houses and Queen Anne style homes. Various sections of the largely uh, middle class neighborhood have been added to the National Historic Register. The area of Highland Park that the Briley's lived in was nothing fancy, but also far from impoverished. You know, it's a quaint, blue-collar, middle-class neighborhood. Uh, Linwood's little brother, James Darrell Briley Jr., was born two years later, June 6, 1956. And then the youngest Briley boy, Anthony Ray, born another two years later, February 17, 1958. Uh, the Briley's did also have an older brother named Edward Jerome. Uh, would go by the nickname of Boot. Most of his life, uh, Boot will not factor into today's story at all. He was born two years before Linwood, 
July 7th, 1952, uh, died a few years back, November 19th, 2020. And for reasons that are unclear, at the end of his last year of junior high, he wanted to move to North Carolina and live with his two aunts, Lizzie C. Williams and Beulah C. Peppers, and his cousin, Norman Williams. His mom gave him permission to leave only if the two aunts accepted him, and they did. And he moved to Hamilton, and he never returned to Richmond. And he was never involved in any of his brother's criminal activities. And as far as we can tell, he never spoke about uh, his brothers publicly. Never said a bad word, or at least not to the press about his brothers or about his parents. Why did he move out? Was something bad going on at home? Uh, If it was, could that bad thing have been uh, his little brother Linwood being a monster? It it is something to keep in mind going forward, I think. Uh, The Briley brothers were raised for most of their childhoods in uh, one home, right? The the home that uh, they were living in when they were born. Uh, Raised by both their parents for most of their childhood, Bertha and James Daryl Briley Sr. James and Bertha were, according to every source I've come across, universally well-liked, respected, considered to be wonderful neighbors, you know, hard workers, just good people overall. Uh, Makes it more strange to me that Boot wanted to leave. James Sr. had a solid job with nice benefits working for the School Street Concrete Block Factory. And Bertha worked at The Grill at Virginia Union University. Former Richmond, former Richmond mayor Dwight Jones said that Mrs. Briley is one of the sweetest ladies you would ever want to meet. The Briley brothers' defense attorney, Hal Hayes, added that Mrs. Briley was a lovely lady. You would never attributed her to bringing up three boys that turned out as bad as these three people. Thinking about this description, today's episode really made me think about how fucking horrible it would be if not only were you not a bad parent, not a bad abusive parent, but what if you were actually a good, loving parent and still three out of your four kids and all three who, you know, stayed in your home throughout their childhood ended up becoming not just like bad people, but brutal murderers. As I get older, I do realize more and more the limits of parental influence. As my son, you know, is off in college now, uh, Lindsay and I have, you know, definitely influenced both Kyler and Monroe you know, curbed certain not so good behaviors. I would like to think a bit over the years, uh, encouraged other good behaviors to kind of, you know, nourish them and see them grow. But at the same time, you know, both of the kids, like who they were at like two years old in many ways is how they are today. Like my daughter Monroe from birth, it seems has always been just, you know, a bit more independent, uh, a bit less interested in hanging with her parents than maybe, you know, uh, Kyler has been, or just, uh, needing a certain social circle at all. Really. Uh, Kyler has always been, you know, very, uh, stubborn and opinionated in certain ways, way more talkative and aggressive when it comes to getting out with, with his, you know, what's on his mind and trying to convince you to agree with him. Monroe has always been outside of her, you know, terrible toddler years you know, just more naturally thoughtful when it comes to the emotional tone of a room or the emotional needs of others uh, around her. Kyler has the weirder sense of humor. Um, Monroe, more of a people watcher, more content in the background than her brother. And on and on. You know, there have been a lot of tendencies and traits they truly just seem to have been born with. And the most frustrating trait with Kyler is probably that he doesn't, you know, naturally think about others when it comes to uh, like a group activity or their birthdays, you know, et cetera. He has to really work on that. He does, largely with Lindsay's help. You know, she's been good that way. Monroe, the most frustrating trait is probably just kind of a blind confidence where she just quickly feels like she knows exactly what she's doing, even if she has no clue what she's doing. And she has zero interest in you trying to teach her anything. You know, and she's aware and she works on that. You know, sports has helped. She's uh, uh, more open to listening to her coaches than she was even a year ago, you know, kind of realizing that. And these are not the worst traits at all. These are very normal human traits. We all have negative and positive traits. But I was thinking with this episode, like what if one or both of them was born with a tendency, you know, a predilection to uh, to want to fucking hurt people, like really hurt them or hurt animals? Uh, what if they genuinely didn't seem to have any empathy combined with a penchant for true sadism? You know, what if that was your kid? You know, what, what if that were your kids? Like you just ended up with those people and you don't have the tools to teach them to avoid their worst instincts and impulses, or or there aren't any fucking tools to teach them that. I do believe that the nature versus nurture debate exists like almost everything else in life on a spectrum, on a continuum, right? Some people's nature more uh, malleable than other people's nature as well. 
right? The, the nurture goes a lot further with some than it does for others. And that in rare cases, uh, I also believe that, you know, some people's nature is on the very extreme end, the bad end of the spectrum, the not good at all end. Just like some people are born with uh, a natural athleticism that makes them, you know, uh, exceptionally fast or, you know, they have a, uh, an advantage when it comes to being exceptionally fast. I definitely believe that there are other people born with a natural drive to just be fucking terrible. Rare, I think, but possible. And, and I do think in this story, as we go forward here, that, that Lynn would at the very least, maybe also James, I don't think Anthony, the youngest, was born that way. It seems. Or, you know, who the fuck knows, maybe something terrible happened that, you know, never made it to sources that led to to boot leaving and led to the three other brothers turning into pieces of shit. But man, just when you look at the totality of everybody's, you know, uh, memories of these guys and just the evidence, it's like, ah, man, were they just fucking born terrible? You know, I don't know. Before all hell broke broke loose, uh, some of the Briley's neighbors, neighbors did tell the Richmond Times dispatch that they were quiet neighbors. They didn't bother anybody. So like, you know, maybe something was uh, kind of uh, latent under there, just hiding under the surface and then came out as they got a little older. Christopher Morgan, uh, son of a detective who was involved in the case, uh, said he knew some of the Briley's classmates and, you know, they did say that they were bullies. So maybe they were just getting worse in their bullying as time went on and then it just crossed a certain line. Still other neighbors, though, would describe young Linwood as, you know, considerate, mowed lawns for elderly neighbors, helped friends fix their cars. One of his defense attorneys, Craig Cooley, would tell the Washington Post, I would rank Linwood as the most pleasant, courteous, respectful client I've ever had. Could not have been more of a gentleman. Uh, Cooley also said that the Briley's were a very close family, and I found them to be a very loving family. I don't know. Uh, James Sr. told CBS Sixes, uh, the local uh, affiliate there in Richmond, uh, Mark Holmberg, that Linwood was practically a genius. A lot of people will talk about how he was so smart. He could not identify anything that could have caused uh, his sons to become murderers. You know, were there any red flags when these guys were young that might make you think, oh man, we might want to keep a closer eye on these fuckers. Not, not in sources, not really. Some sources pointed to their unique pets growing up as a possible red flag. I don't know. Unusual, but I don't know if it's a red flag. The Briley boys uh, enjoyed collecting exotic and or dangerous pets. They had tarantulas, piranhas, boa constrictors, other snakes, some uh, aggressive, I guess, Doberman pinchers. But a lot of people have pets like those. And they don't, you know, become serial killers. Some sources say that the uh, Briley's really like to feed live mice to their snakes or piranhas for entertainment. Okay, yeah, you know, uh, like they apparently, especially Linwood, you know, enjoyed watching predators eat prey. Maybe an early warning sign of predatory natures. Maybe not, though, you know, could be a stretch. But uh, oldest brother Boot did love hunting. Member of the Jump and Run Hunting Club from 1978 to 2017. Also a member of Dugan's Hunting Club, both in North Carolina. Could be nothing. Just did find it interesting that on Boots' obituary, his main passion was hunting. Like he couldn't hunt enough. And when you combine that with how the other three brothers, raged, raised largely separately, loved watching pets kill other animals, you know, it did make me think like, huh, that's unusual. Unnatural fascination with, you know, predators and prey maybe. But had they not become murderers, I wouldn't fucking, you know, think of that at all. I wouldn't see that connection. Like, I'm a hunter. I don't fucking care about shooting a deer. It doesn't make me, like, super sad. Bother some people, you know. Uh, I could try and tell you I care, but I don't. Watching a snake eat a mouse, I don't fucking, I don't care. <laughs> like, it doesn't bother me either. I mean, if you let me play with that mouse for a few days before and it had a name and it did cool tricks and wore cute little outfits, then you fed it to a snake. Yeah, I'm not going to love that. But, you know, I don't know. A lot of people do all of this stuff and are not abnormal, not callous killers. But the fascination with killing creatures for all four brothers, you know, did give me pause. But that's it. That's that's the worst I could find from their early childhood up to around, you know, uh, end of the junior high years. Prosecutors later said that the brothers uh, might not have been properly supervised as older teens, but no family problems that could explain their violent behavior as young adults. Like no one came forward to be like, oh, my God, their parents were awful or somebody did this to them. Like nobody. Uh, there was one significant event in their lives uh, when they were teens, no exact as date assigned to it, but at some point when Linwood was towards the end of high school, their parents did split up, but again, it's pretty common, and then Bertha did move out of the house, and, and this is a little unusual, you know, all the boys then lived not with their mother, but with their father, which is not traditional, and why did that happen? Well, uh, it sounds like their mom might have been afraid of them. 
you know, at least some of them. Uh, again, no exact date assigned to her moving out, but she might have left around the time of her murder. I'll talk about real soon. Uh, one source says the boy's mother, Bertha, moved out of the house as she did not feel safe. Excuse me. She did not feel safe, but they provide no additional details. Uh, Bertha just passed away a few months ago, April 13th, 2023. And I checked out some memorial pages set up for her. Well, one created by the funeral home, Mims Funeral Home in Richmond. Seems she never uh, never moved away, never remarried. Um, and there was a post from a woman named Edith who described herself as Bertha's coworker. And Edith wrote, I will miss Mrs. Uh, Bertha Briley. I used to ride with her to North Carolina. I enjoyed the trip. It was full of joy and fun. She showed me how to do catering. She helped me a lot. I'm still at work. Uh, she was by my side when I lost my son, Melvin Brooks. She never felt or never left me alone or never stopped calling me. She was not just my boss, but was a good friend to tell you. Uh, I just want to tell you, you'll never be forgotten. Your family you know, has my prayers. Another woman who calls herself Callie B, who describes herself as Bertha's best friend, said that Bertha made a, the world a better place by sharing herself with others, that she was a strong black woman with a beautiful spirit. She was a gift from God, a true family person. Someone who liked to laugh at how her brother David would dance and a lot of other nice things. And there's all kind of pictures of her with what looks like friends and family of all ages. And I know that looks can be deceiving, like very deceiving, in fact. But she did look really kind and sweet. Her eyes seemed to be very kind. Her actual obituary doesn't say much about her other than she had four sons, never remarried, and worked for many years in the cafeteria at Virginia Union University, uh, rising to the position of catering director. And that she was thought of, uh, you know, very highly by many people. Interesting, uh, also listed as Mrs. Briley, as if she and James Sr., despite living apart for roughly the last 50 years of her life, never divorced. Um, can't find any information about, you know, uh, her sharing details about how she felt about her son. She must have denied requests for interviews. I just wonder... Why would this woman who I can't find a single person with a bad word to say about her, a woman whose murderous sons never seem to say a bad word about her either. Why would she move out, separate from her husband, but not get divorced, continue to work at the same job, live in the same city, but not have her sons live with her. And I do think based on everything I've, you know, researched with this and read and watched that she was afraid of them. Numerous sources state that uh, after she moved out, the boy's father, James Sr. started doing something very unusual. He started padlocking his bedroom door at night uh, from the inside. Dude wasn't just locking his bedroom door, locking it with a fucking padlock from the inside, like in his own home. <laughs> like, was he scared of his, uh, his kids as well? You know, sources, some sources say he was also. It's all very strange. Okay, January 28th, 1971 now is when Linwood committed his first murder. He's 16 years old. Brother James is 14. Littlest brother, Anthony's 12. Uh, fucking boot, Eddie. He's out in North Carolina. Uh, and maybe this is around the time Bertha was like, I got to get out of here. Linwood Briley murdered his 57-year-old neighbor, Orlean Christian. Shot her with a rifle from his bedroom window while she was hanging laundry on a clothesline. Fucking what? Didn't sneak across town and like hide in the bushes in the middle of the night and then snipe some stranger and then scurry home under the cover of darkness? No, fucker just like kneeled on his bed and not even at night in the middle of the afternoon and shot the lady across the street. Even crazier to me, almost got away with it. Uh, Orlean's husband had recently passed away and at first her relatives thought she died of a stress-related heart attack. When her body was found, no one noticed any blood or bullet wound. Uh, but when then uh, the funeral home returned the robe that Orlean was wearing when she got shot, her family noticed a small bloody hole in the fabric. The family asked the funeral director to re-examine the body. Small caliber bullet wound was found under Orlean's armpit. Mortician just missed the bullet wound the first time around because no one suspected foul play. And clearly it was a small wound with no big exit wound. Sources don't say what gun uh, Linwood used for this uh, murder, but he'll use a 22 later. He'll be pretty fond of a 22. He, he'll use multiple weapons, but I bet that's what he used on her. But from his bedroom fucking window, like how long had he been wanting just to kill somebody before he pulled the trigger? And were his little brothers watching? Hey, 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 dudes, get over here. Get over here. Check this shit out. How much you want to bet I can fucking take out Mrs. Christensen across the street? One shot. Fuck that bitch. How many times have I mowed her lawn? And how many times has she paid me for that? Never. Once police knew that Orlean had been shot, they started searching, you know, for her shooter. Uh, didn't take long to catch Linwood. A detective got a two by four. 
took it to Orlean's property, cut it to her height, studied the autopsy report, and then drilled a hole in the two by four showing, uh, the, you know, with the angle that Orlean had been, you know, shot from, and then just kind of moved that board around, you know, in the position where she fell thinking like, you know, where would that bullet have come from? And he's looking through the two by four and he's looking at Linwood Briley's bedroom window. So good work, detective. Dude knew his geometry. When investigators searched the Briley house, they then found the murder weapon. And for a supposedly really smart dude, Linwood was a fucking moron when he was 16. I think most of us are. But shoots a neighbor lady to death and then, you know, just doesn't even bother to hide the murder weapon. And had they not found that weapon, likely would have not been able to charge him with anything. And he would have gotten away with sniping a neighbor. When questioned about the killing, and now deceased Richmond detective Norman Harding recalled that Linwood said he was shooting at a bird and he must have accidentally shot Orlean and then showed zero remorse. In fact, he tried to make light of the 57-year-old woman's death saying, well, she was going to die anyway. 1971 psychological report on Linwood prepared after he was charged states, it seems as though Linwood Briley does not want to accept responsibility for his actions. He expresses no concern that a person died because he was shooting a gun, stating that she would have died anyhow, for he had heard from someone that she had heart trouble. That's cold-blooded. Why is everyone making such a big deal out of this? Oh my God. It's not like she was 18 or even 30. She was practically dead. She was 57. And she might've had a weak ticker. You know what? I did her a fucking favor. I should be given a prize or something. Not arrested. Fuck her and her pussy ass heart. Uh, Linwood's attorney sadly were able to successfully argue that he accidentally shot Orlean while shooting some pigeons. And you know what? Maybe he was. Maybe that first kill was an accident, an accident that changed him. He was convicted of manslaughter and would serve uh, just a year in a juvenile institution and then would just go back home. And how weird is that? If like one of your neighbors shoots another one of your neighbors to death and they go away for just a year and then they come right back. How nervous, like, are you thinking about selling your house and getting out of that neighborhood? Uh, When talking about how Linwood may have influenced his brothers after this shooting, Dr. Catherine Ramsland, uh, a noted forensic psychologist who studies serial killers, told the producers of a, uh, a show she was a, a cast member of essentially for years, Born to Kill, a British true crime TV series, aired episodes between 2005 and 2016. And she said he would have probably bragged to them. He would have probably strutted about because that was his personality. And so for them, they probably would have thought, you know, wow, this is a really bold thing to do. So he's certainly modeling for them, you know, what it, what it takes to be a man. God, what if she's right? That was some man shit, you fucking dorks. You want to be a snivelly little bitch your whole life? Or do you want to nut up and shoot a neighbor lady to death, hanging clothes uh, out on her fucking lawn from your window? God, several people involved in this case, investigators, journalists, etc., cetera, uh, did make a point to talk about how these brothers were all about being tough, right? Being strong, alpha males, being, being the boa constrictor, not the mouse, you know, apex predators. They were guys who hated, again, what they considered weakness. I guess that fucking, you know, neighbor lady was, I guess, weak because she had a bad ticker, maybe. Uh, James Briley would uh, soon somewhat follow in his older brother Linwood's footsteps. So two years later, uh, 1973, about a year after Linwood's back home, Richmond PD officer Cecil L. Glunt exchanged fire with James Briley after James robbed a convenience store. Try my best to ignore how close his last name is to both Blunt and Cunt. Uh, officer Glunt uh, was on duty and nearby when the robbery happened and he pursued James. After a close quarters gunfight, he shot James in his side, knocked him over, but then James popped up, ran 12 more blocks before he was apprehended. He was tough. Uh, James was eventually convicted of malicious wounding and robbery, spent some time in prison, and then actually would be on parole uh, during the 1979 murder spree. Now let's take a moment to meet the fourth member of the Briley group, uh, one of their neighbors, young Duncan Meekins. Duncan lived two doors down from the Briley home. Uh, Meekins completed the eighth grade at Graves Middle School was a student at John Marshall High when he was arrested in 1979 at the age of 16. Five years younger than Anthony, the youngest Briley brother, and nine years younger than Linwood. One fellow classmate would tell the Richmond Times Dispatch that Meekins played JV uh, football at the high school. Uh, He was well-liked. He was a good-looking young man with high academic standing. Prosecutor Robert Rice would say about him, he came from a very well-grounded background as far as I could tell. He was a good student or a decent student. Active in the church, uh, had been an altar boy. Richmond homicide detective Jim Gade, uh, who worked some of the Briley brothers' murders, said Meekins lived next door to the Briley's. 
Uh, some people say next door. Some people say two doors down in sources. And they were idols to him, basically. You know, he thought they were, you know, big, tough people. And he wanted to get involved. So they kind of took him under their wing. And that is such a good reminder to pay close attention to who your kids are hanging out with. Who are they spending time with? What peers are they looking up to? My wife, Lindsay, does a great job of following all of Kyler and Monroe's friends on social media, talking to other parents, keeping tabs on, you know, what the kids' friends are up to. I pay attention as well, especially when I meet them, but Lindsay is like a fucking PI with that stuff. Um, you know, just make sure the, the kids aren't hanging out with kids who are like, I don't know, how I was <laughs> as a teenager. I was a fucking savage. Not a murderer, not violent crime, but a lot of mayhem, a lot of property destruction, theft, and, you know, quite a bit of fire. I was a troubled kid. Thankfully, not as troubled as the Briley brothers. Uh, speaking of the Briley brothers, now the real carnage begins. 1979, not a great year for Richmond, Virginia. No idea what the Briley brothers were up to between 1973 and 1979, but whatever it was, it didn't get them sent to prison for life or worse. If they sniped any more neighbor ladies, I guess they got away with it. March 12th, 1979, the Briley crew, three brothers and Duncan Meekins, attacked their first two victims, William and Virginia Butcher. Virginia living in Virginia, a married couple from Henrico County. All of Henrico County is in the Richmond metro area, by the way, just kind of just kind of wraps around the north and east sides of the city. In 2009, a then 88-year-old William Butcher would speak with the Richmond Times Dispatch about his attack. Uh, his wife, Virginia, had passed away by that point. He said that at around 9 p.m. that night, the Briley's knocked on the door. At first, William thought it was the paper boy trying to collect payment. But when he answered the door, he ended up staring at a cold-blooded, grown-ass man, a master of mayhem, about to turn 25 years old, Linwood Briley. Linwood, who he did not know, told him that his car had broken down and he was asking uh, you know, for some help calling AA or AAA. Uh, William, trying to be a nice guy, trying to do the right thing, said he would call for him, ask for his AAA card. Linwood now pulled out some kind of card and then William opened the door to take it. And when he did that, Linwood pulled out a gun and pushed his way inside. Virginia then saw Linwood approaching, pointing a gun at William and holding a knife to his throat. Before she could scream, another member of the crew told her not to make any noise or they would cut off William's ear. That's a strange threat, right? Ear. Not slit his throat. Not blow his brains out. No, they went straight to, we'll slice his fucking ear off. And that's actually scarier to me because of how odd and specific it is. Like, I feel like in that scenario, if someone broke into my home with a gun and told me that they're going to blow my fucking brains out, like, I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be scared, but also that's something like people say in movies all the time. I mean, a part of my brain's like, but that might be a hollow threat. That's like a a thing that people say to sound tough. But if I am told that they're going to cut my fucking ear off, especially like while they're holding a gun too. I mean, I know I had a knife as well, but I'm just going to assume that like, oh yeah, they put some thought into this and maybe that they cut off, they've cut off ears before, right? That's their thing. Cutting off ears. I hear that. I'm like, ah, they probably, they probably will do it. They, They might want an excuse to do it. Well, Virginia, uh, she believes him. She doesn't yell. William gets to keep his ear. William and Virginia are then forced to lie down in separate rooms and tied up. William said that he believes that the only reason he and Virginia survived that night was because Duncan Meekins was inexperienced. All right, this is the beginning of their spree. William asked Duncan, who was tying him up, not to tie him up too tight because it would hurt. And Meekins, you know, he's 16 years old. He listened. William said, this guy Meekins was the guy that I think tied me up. I think he was the rookie. He didn't know too much about what was going on. While the butchers were uh, tied up, the Briley's then ransacked their house and poured lighter fluid all over the place, even on uh, William's legs. They soaked the sofa, put clothes under a table to help the fire spread faster, and then they lit that shit and bounced. Fortunately, after the group left, William was able to wiggle a hand free and untie himself and then quickly cut Virginia loose, and they got out of the house. House was destroyed, though. Their car uh, was stolen. Uh, TV, jewelry, gun, other valuables gone. Pet cat burned to death. William had been cut on his hand while being tied up. Uh, Virginia did escape uninjured. Both of them, you know, a lot more fortunate than future attack victims. The Briley's caused an estimated ten thousand worth of dollars worth of damage to the butcher house, uh, and that number doesn't really do it what they did justice, though. Uh, ten thousand doesn't make it sound as bad as it was. You know, the Briley's destroyed their fucking house, virtually everything inside. You know, nearly everything they had uh, just happened to add up to about ten grand, equivalent to about forty three grand today. So not only did they needlessly just fuck up this couple's lives. You know, kill their their pet, almost kill them. They just fucked over two strangers who who didn't have much to start with, and then stole their car. At least the car was found later by Richmond police, uh, according to Henrico detective Ron Wells. 
excuse me, uh, men watching the description uh, or men matching the description of the attackers had knocked on at least two other doors in the same neighborhood before the attack. A man living in one of those houses said the guy who showed up at his door told him that his car broke down, asked to use his phone, but that guy refused. Uh, during the second interaction, the man at the door, likely Linwood, you know, in all these interactions, asked for someone who didn't live there. And that's when the resident shut the door on him. How happy were both of those people when they found out later what had happened to the butchers? And when they found out who the Briley brothers were, oof. Just nine days later, March 21st, 1979, the Briley strike again, this time fatally. They kill a 20-year-old vending machine serviceman named Michael W. McDuffie. Michael McDuffie worked for the Canteen of Virginia, company that is still around, still filling up vending machines with all sorts of tasty snacks today. The Briley's broke into his house, assaulted him, shot him, robbed him, left his dying body in his car. No extra details listed in sources. Some sources do say that they killed him while he was at work, but most say while he was at home. Perhaps because it was early on in the murder spree and because this killing in particular looked like it was, you know, part of a random robbery. At the time of his death, it, it barely made the news. Like a few lines, one of the back pages of the local paper. Uh, his obituary was longer than the original mention of his murder. Just 10 days later, March 31st, 1979, Linwood Riley fatally shoots 24-year-old Edric Alvin Clark over some type of drug dispute that involved Duncan Meekins. And his murder literally didn't make the paper at all. I leaned into uh, newspaper databases a lot more on this episode than most, trying to find extra details. And Olivia Lee, the initial researcher for this week's episode, she is fantastic with newspaper databases. I feel like she subscribes to all of them and to court document databases as well. Almost nothing about this guy. Uh, local media still has no idea that there are active serial killers, right? Getting going in Richmond. These are just like, you know, random robbery killings. Uh, nine days later, the crew strikes again. Sadly, uh, you know, we have more details for a more brutal attack in this instance. April 9th, 1979, the Briley's followed 76-year-old Mary W. Gowan as she made her way across town after, uh, you know, babysitting her grandchildren at a, at a daughter's house. So they're following a 76-year-old woman. What the fuck? Mary was attacked on the back steps of her apartment building, a, a building where she lived with another daughter and uh, more grandkids. Uh, she was grabbed, dragged down a basement stairwell. In the basement, she was raped robbed of what little bit of cash she had on her and then shot in the head. Linwood and Duncan were the two who robbed Mary. Linwood, evil ringleader, the one who raped her and shot her. Anthony Briley present during the crime but not actively involved. Despite being shot in the fucking head, sources don't say what kind of weapon was used, but I, I'm guessing again it was something like a small caliber like a, like a 22. Mary managed to drag herself up the damn stairs after her attack and then this 76-year-old made it inside the building, made it to her daughter's door, knocked on it before collapsing, uh, right? She was babysitting for another kid of uh, hers across town. Nancy Gowan, Mary's daughter, living in the residence, she just knocked on, said, my 14-year-old daughter is hearing the noise, opens the door on the chain, finds her grandmother, who says three words, I've been raped. And she went into a coma, would remain in a coma for 90 days. My God, Mary died without ever waking up from that coma, July 2nd. St. Mary's Hospital. So I've been raped were her final words. And her 14-year-old granddaughter is who heard them. Imagine that's you. Imagine that's your grandma. Mary's cause of death listed as complications of gunshot wound to the head, according to the state medical examiner's office. Nancy later discussed her feelings about the murder, saying, I was angry, of course, that someone could do something like this. My mother and I had been estranged at the time, so guilt mixed in with the anger. I could never make things right with my mother because this person had taken her away. Weird side note here with Mary's daughter, Nancy. Roughly 15 years after her mom is raped and killed by one of the worst serial killers, you know, Richmond has ever known, Nancy is doing outreach work with the area's mentally ill and homeless population. And on numerous occasions, she would sit on a piano bench at the shelter with this guy who was tickling the ivories, this guy, Les Burchart, man described as a quiet schizophrenic who would walk around with cotton in his ears sometimes to uh, quiet the voices in his head. She would talk to Burchard. She would listen to him play. Uh, he would play mostly classical music. He was really good. He seemed kind and gentle so much so she called him Mr. Meek. She would hurry with her work some days so uh, get it done fast so she could sit, you know, nearby or on the bench with him and hear him play before heading home. And while she's doing this, she would later find out he was an active serial killer. Dude killed at least three homeless men and four elderly women in their homes. Almost killed another homeless woman, beat her so badly she ended up with 36 skull fractures, but somehow lived. He died in prison at the age of 52 
and he's suspected of killing perhaps around a dozen people. Most of the additional victims, elderly women killed in their homes, right? Uh, so very similar to Nancy's mom. He would typically either strangle victims, bash in their head, or bash in their head with a blunt object. Weird dual serial killer connection for Nancy. Uh, dual serial killers, uh, killers partially targeting older women as well in a city not known for a lot of serial killers in general. Back to the Briley brothers. Three months after killing Mary, July 3rd, 1979, the Briley's assault a very different victim. They uh, see 17-year-old Christopher Phillips standing near Linwood's car. Uh, Looked like he was like maybe looking in the window. They suspect he's trying to steal the car. And because they suspect that, they drag him into a nearby yard and just start beating the shit out of him, just aggressively. When he tries to call out for help, Linwood picks up a big old cinder block and smashes his fucking head in. It's brutal. Christopher Phillips found bludgeoned to death in a backyard of a house on Seminary Avenue, not far from the Briley home. The day after being killed on July 4th, Briley's lived on 3117 North Avenue, if you're from the area and curious as to where exactly they lived. Uh, a resident of the house where the body was dumped found uh, the body at 9.45 a.m. The residents reported hearing noises in the yard at 11.30 p.m. the night before, but the noise stopped, and then they forgot about it until the morning. Detective uh, J.S. Gade said that Christopher was familiar to juvenile officers but had nothing serious on his record. Uh, his death would make the paper, but like barely. Small article on page C2 of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Two and a half months later, September 14th, 1979, the Briley gang murdered their next victim, a 62-year-old popular country and Western music disc jockey named John Harvey Gallagher. John Gallagher worked for WXCI and went by the nickname of Johnny G. Uh, Johnny G's death will get more press, but not as much as I would have thought for a popular local DJ. Bottom of page B8. John was performing with his band at the Log Cabin, a nightclub in Richmond the night he was murdered. He stepped outside for a smoke break and was met by the Briley's, who had been looking for a victim all night and were just waiting to attack uh, whoever stepped outside the club. How fucking weird is that? Just, just, you know, just ready to attack whoever popped out. Why? It doesn't seem like they had any sort of plan. It, it was like from time to time, they just got a hankering to kill somebody. And so they just did. Reminds me of kids my age when I was a teen who would just drive around uh, taking a baseball bat to mailboxes, right? Just for the fuck of it. Or put a simple homemade bomb in a mailbox, right? Empty two liter bottle, uh, some hydrochloric acid, some aluminum foil. The aluminum reacts with the acid, creates a gas. The gas it starts to expand until the plastic can't contain it. And then boom, blown up mailbox. I remember one night, I just walked down the sidewalk, kicking each uh, streetlight I walked past uh, over and over until it was like these little decorative streetlights in this apartment complex, uh, until the bulb would rock against the glass, you know, decorative glass around the bulb hard enough to, to break it so the light would go out. So just needlessly shattering one lamp after another, probably broke a dozen or more. Why? I don't know. Just wanted to. You know, to quote Limp Biscuit. and if my day keeps going this way, I just might break something tonight. Just fucking felt like breaking stuff. These guys seem to be like that to me, except instead of breaking cheap, easily replaceable light bulbs or smashing mailboxes, they just fucking smashed and killed people. According to court documents on the night of the robbery, the group had a sawed off shotgun and a high caliber rifle in their car. High caliber rifle. Uh, they parked near a log cabin, uh, quote, to see if a possible victim again was going to come out, hid behind some bushes, just literally hide in the bushes. Linwood had the rifle. Meekins had the shotgun. John came out the back door, walked over to the bushes, had himself a smoke. Linwood fucking popped out of the bushes, rifle in hand, ordered Gallagher to lie face down. Linwood then took his wallet and keys and ordered Meekins to go find his car. When Meekins came back with uh, Gallagher's car, the two of them forced Gallagher to lie on the rear floorboard. Anthony and James initially drove off in the car before joining the other two in Gallagher's car. All drove out to nearby Mayo Island on the James River. Mayo Island, a privately owned uh, little piece of land, According to a 2015 book on the Briley brothers, there's now a parking lot and recycling center on the island. Uh, in 1979, there was an abandoned paper mill and it could be easily accessed via this uh, Mayo Bridge. When they got to the paper mill, Linwood and Duncan forced Gallagher out of the car. When he started struggling to stand up, Linwood came up with the rifle and shot him. And then they tossed his body in the river. The entire event lasted 15, 20 minutes. They left in Gallagher's car, drove around until the tank was almost empty. They stripped the car apart and then abandoned it. Uh, and by stripping apart, parts, I mean the group stole a CB radio and an antenna. And then they got six bucks off of Gallagher. Six fucking bucks and two pieces of cheap pawn shop bullshit. The police found John's jacket, belt, and papers in the parking lot of Log Cabin. They also saw what looked like blood on the pavement. 
John Gallagher's car found on 9th Street, September 15th. The police found blood in the back seat, hairpiece next to the car. Someone tried to pry the speakers from the door but failed. And they found a, a fingerprint behind the door panel. And that would be Linwood Briley's fingerprint. Johnny's body found two days after he died, September 16th, on Mayo Island, half submerged at the foot of a bank of, uh, on the James River. September 17th, 1979, the state medical examiner's office determines that John died of a gunshot wound in the back. Police initially thought it was a shot to the chest, but that was the exit wound. Linwood Briley identified as a suspect when the police found his fingerprints in John's car. And he'll later testify as the only witness for the defense of his trial for the murder of John Gallagher. He testified that he didn't leave home until midnight or 1230, uh, you know, the night of uh, Gallagher's death. Uh, when the prosecution said he was killed, Linwood said Duncan Meekins asked for a ride to visit his uncle. He uh, let him out on Jefferson Davis Highway, went to a food shop to meet a woman. His car broke down. Eventually, he said that Meekins pulled back up in a in a Lincoln, which is weird because that's the type of car that Gallagher drove, and then drove him to pick up a battery. Meekins offered to sell him a watch and ring, said he could take parts from the car because his uncle would trade it in. And he paid Meekins for the watch and ring, he said, and, you know, took some parts. But then the woman in question did not back up his alibi. She testified that she knew Linwood because he had dated her sister, but she hadn't seen or heard from him in months. So probably should have uh, should have picked somebody fucking better to back his play when he tried to throw Meekins under the bus and blame him for the murder. Two weeks after seamlessly, uh, you know, uh, or senselessly killing a local country DJ, September 30th, 1979, now the Briley's follow 62-year-old nurse, Mary Wilfong, to her apartment. Mary was coming home after working on a private duty nursing uh, case. Neighbors heard her screaming about 11.15 p.m. Ten minutes later, the police received an anonymous phone call reporting a suspicious situation outside Mary's apartment building. Uh, Mary was still alive when members of the Tuckahoe Volunteer Rescue Squad arrived at her apartment, but barely alive. She was sprawled out on the front steps of her apartment building with her keys in her hand and bleeding badly. She was soon pronounced dead at the hospital. She died of a head wound inflicted with a blunt instrument. Her purse was missing, indicating robbery was the motive. Meekins will later testify that they followed Mary with the intention of robbing her and that Linwood took a fucking home run swing at her head with that baseball bat when she refused to hand him her purse. And then down she went. James Bradley drove the car to Mary Wilfong's apartment, uh, but waited in the car, according to Meekins. James' defense would argue that he was out of sight during the incident. Meekins will testify that Anthony watched the robbery. Yet again, the initial murder does not make the fucking paper. Articles will come out about it, but only after the Bradleys are caught and numerous cases are then connected. So while the Briley's are terrorizing the city, uh, you know, people don't know about it. Uh, you know, people will know later in another incident, but right now they don't know, uh, you know, what's going on. Just a week later, October 6, 1979, the Briley's murder 75-year-old Blanche Page and 59-year-old Charles Garner, her boarder. Uh, Blanche was bludgeoned to death. Charles was beaten with that damn baseball bat again, also stabbed with five knives, a pair of scissors, and a fucking fork. The scissors and the fork were found, uh, you know, sticking out of his back when investigators arrived. An investigator who worked his crime scene said that despite he and his fellow officers, you know, being no strangers to seeing dead bodies, being pretty jaded, seeing what happened to, uh, to these bodies really shook everybody up. It was brutal. He used the word overkill to describe it. Right? Linwood and his crew just went berserk. Police believe the murders took place after 7.30 p.m. Saturday, October 6th, well, when Garner was last seen in the yard by a neighbor. Blanche's neighbors were already concerned about her uh, before her murder. She was partially paralyzed and rarely left her house. A neighbor noticed the front door open, saw a room in disarray, called the police on the evening of October 7th. Police entered the house, discovered a shocking crime scene. Head of homicide, Stuart Cook said, The thing that struck me as soon as I walked in the door was seen up the stairwell. The whole wall and steps were just covered in blood all the way up. My God. Charles Garner found in the kitchen. Uh, not just beaten and stabbed, uh, pages from a phone book were lit on fire on his back as well. Blanche was found in her bed. Blanche beaten very badly with a baseball bat. Detective Jim Gaudet recalled, they didn't just hit her. They kept beating on her. I don't care how long you've been a policeman. That's hard to see and take because what somebody can do to a human body is just unbelievable. So both victims here, not just beaten to death, beaten far past the point of death. Uh, it, it appeared that once again, robbery was the motive in the Page and Garner murders because the house was ransacked, but nothing of much value was taken. Are the citizens of Richmond now living in fear? No, this double homicide does make the paper, uh, makes the front page of the local news section. 
for the October 8th, 1979 edition. So page one of the B section. And it's at the bottom of the page. Small article below several big pictures at the top of the page of a bunch of kids playing outside under this headline of a fall day free for all. Then under that, there's some article about a Republican U.S. Congress targeting some liberal Virginia representative over some bill whatnot. Under that, Stump Dump yields a tale of intrigue. It's a story about the local landfill where some Russian embassy employees, I, I don't know, dumped a bunch of fucking papers and stuff years ago. It's turned out not to be very interesting, actually. And then under that little type, two found dead in Northside House. Reading the article, it, it comes across as another random burglary that turned violent. I mean, I mean, I guess maybe it was good that the local Richmond Press in 1979 did not follow that adage of if it bleeds, it leads. They actually seemed to go way in the other direction. If it bleeds, uh, bury it in the back of the paper. Put it next to a sale for tires or something. You know, don't don't alarm people. Uh, Linwood's defense later presented three witnesses who testified that he was in North Carolina during these murders. But, you know, he no, he wasn't. He was not. Uh, one woman testified that Garner and Page were two months or two hundred thousand dollars behind on payments to local drug and prostitution ringleaders. Uh, she was trying to make the jury think that this was a gang related hit. Does that make sense to you? That a partially paralyzed, nearly bedridden, 75-year-old woman who almost never leaves the house and a 59-year-old man who rents a room from her downstairs owed $200,000 that they spent on blow and pussy. I don't think so. I'm not fucking by. Uh, Lynn would testify that he couldn't remember where he was that weekend but denied uh, committing the murders. He can testify that Lynn would absolutely committed those murders. He said Blanche was killed first, then Garner. When he was asked by Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Robert Rice how he felt about the murders, he said, I feel like if I hadn't told Briley about Garner buying stuff, he'd still be living. Uh, Duncan indicated that Garner occasionally bought stolen property. And they went to the house to rob Charles Garner of his pistol collection, but then didn't find the guns. Uh, they stole money and a cassette slash radio. Uh, man, this, this theme of just like not getting much shit from these robberies just continues. I feel like they were in it mostly for the killing. Uh, the very next week, October 14th, 1979, Duncan Meekins fatally shoots 30, 32-year-old Thomas Saunders. Linwood and James were involved in some type of fight. Uh, no press once again. This, dude, this dude's obituary barely makes the paper, like two sentences a few days later. Five days later, October 19th, the Brileys commit their most heinous killing. Ugh. This, this will actually make the front page later. Uh, the killer crew, this is real bad. This is real, real bad. The killer crew murdered 27-year-old Harvey Wilkerson and his common-law wife, 23-year-old Judy Diane Barton. Judy had a five-year-old son named Harvey Wayne Barton, and Judy uh, was eight months pregnant. James Briley had promised a judge earlier that same day that he was going to stay out of trouble since he was on parole, but he did not do that in a big way. Uh, at the time, uh, Henrico police investigator Shirley Englehart was uh, surveilling the Briley's inside a van. Uh, some tips had finally started to come in that these fuckers might be up to something. Shirley heard James and Linwood arguing about whether or not the police were watching them. They approached the van, looked through the windows, then they started shaking the van that she was in. Uh, James even fired a gun into the air, shot again at the ground. Then James said that if the police were inside, they would have to come out after that, which seemed to then make them feel like, you know, the police weren't in the van. Feeling satisfied, they got into their car, they drove off. The crew was uh, still under air and ground surveillance that night, but officers, you know, lost sight of them. Officers who were doing surveillance did hear gunshots later, saw the group get into a car and drive off, but they didn't know exactly where the gunshots came from. Didn't know yet what had happened inside this, uh, this bloody house. The group had been drinking and smoking weed on the night uh, of this, you know, these crimes. They discussed robbing Harvey Wilkinson, who lived on nearby Barton Avenue. Harvey was a known dealer of a designer drug, that I had never heard of before this week called uh, Preludin. From what I read, it's a, it's a type of meth substitute is what I would call it. Uh, once a German diet pill and much more popular back in like the 1960s than it is now. Uh, the Beatles fucked around with it. So did Marilyn Monroe, JFK, Truman Capote, a bunch of other uh, you know uh, known people because it was legal for a bunch of years. Random for it to show up here. And anyway, this group thought that Harvey W. had a large sum of money in his home. Meekins later testified that after dinner at home, he went to the Briley house where they, they drank, they smoked some weed. Uh, then they got into Linwood's car and drove to Barton Avenue to rob some guy named Harvey. Linwood later testified that he, his brothers, and Meekins went to Wilkerson's house to buy weed. He said he knocked on the door, but you know, no one answered. 
And when he left, man, he saw three dudes across the streets, pretty suspicious, one of whom was a drug dealer. Those guys must have done it, not me. Uh, the Briley crew headed to Wilkerson's house in a car driven by Linwood. James bought, uh, brought a shotgun. Linwood brought a 22 caliber pistol. When they got to the house, they hid in a shed to wait for some visitors to leave. Once the visitors left, and this is all according to Meekins, the crew approached Harvey's front door. When he saw the group coming, he uh, first locked his door, but then he was frightened of what the group would do to him if he refused to let them in, so he unlocked it, which would be a big mistake. James and Linwood go in first, followed by Anthony and Duncan. James and uh, Linwood quickly tie up Harvey Wilkerson. They tie up Judy Barton with electrical tape around their arms and legs, acting like they're going to rob him. They're gagged. They're laying on the floor now. Their five-year-old son, little Harvey Wayne, also, you know, told to lie down on the floor, but not bound. While Anthony and James go upstairs, Meekin says he saw Linwood start to drag Judy into the kitchen. Meekin said that Judy's pants had already been pulled down. He didn't see Linwood rape her, but assumed strongly based on what he heard, that's exactly what fucking happened. And it was happening in front of her son and with an earshot of her husband. I mean, truly can't imagine. This is like worst nightmare shit. Meekin said that he then raped Judy, who again is eight months pregnant. After Linwood left the kitchen, after he likely raped her, uh, after Meekins was done, James entered the kitchen, started to unzip his pants. Meekins did not see him rape Judy, but again, assumes that that's what happened. So her third attacker now, all in front of, or nearly in front of, you know, husband and son. These guys have become subhuman fucking monsters. Then when James leaves the kitchen, Linwood drags Judy back into the living room to kill her. Uh, while they were in the house, Linwood gave Duncan a 38 caliber silver Derringer, which he said he took from Harvey. He gave James Briley the 22 he, uh, that they brought with him. James gave Linwood the shotgun. According to Meekins, Linwood soon left the house to start up the car. First, the little boy, Harvey Wayne, shot in the head in front of his parents. Then, according to Meekins, both Harvey and Judy covered with sheets. While he was looking through the front door, people, he heard a gunshot. When he turned around, he saw James Briley standing over Judy, the sheet on her head turning bloody red. James held a pillow in his hand, told Duncan, you go get one, or you got to get one. So now, Harvey Sr., you know, has just heard maybe seen his wife get raped by three dudes, also in front of his son, then watch his son be executed, then his wife is killed. I I can't even fucking process what you would feel having all that happen, right? That's an unfathomable amount of trauma to think about experiencing, right? These motherfuckers. Duncan now picked up a a pillow, covered Harvey Wilkinson's head, shot into it, dropped the 38, picked up the 22 rifle, which was near the door, and runs into the street. He hears more gunshots. James and Anthony then run out behind him. Judy Barton ended up being shot four times. Harvey Wayne, his dad, Harvey, each shot once. The bullet found in Harvey Wayne's body was 38 caliber. The bullets found in Judy's body, a bullet found in the couch and casings on the floor, all 22 caliber. Forensic expert uh, later stated that neither the 38 bullet nor the 22 bullets and casings could have been fired from the 22 rifle found after the murders. You know, it was fired from the pistol. Uh, 22 pistol, 38 pistol used in these killings was never found. Uh, During cross-examination by James Briley's defense about discrepancies in his testimony and pretrial statements later, Duncan will admit that he was present when two more shots were fired and that he actually saw James shoot Harvey B. Uh, We'll get to uh, uh, why later he did this. Uh, The group left the house in the car driven by Linwood. His car had a police scanner, so they learned the police were following them. They stopped the car. Duncan attempted to hide the twenty-two rifle from the Wilkerson house. Linwood dropped the shotgun they brought from the Briley's house over a fence. The shotgun rifle pistol holder will be found later by local residents. The group abandoned their car when they learned the police are still surveilling them. Duncan said that then the uh, the money from the robbery was divided up that evening. And he got about a hundred bucks. Whole fucking family annihilated. Mother raped in front of her son and husband. And they got a, you know, couple hundred bucks. Life is real cheap for this crew. Uh, two days later, October 21st, the bodies of the Wilkerson family are found. The Briley's had released Harvey Wilkerson's uh, pet boa constrictors before they left so animal control had to clear the house before the police could enter apparently in richmond virginia in the 70s fucking boa constrictors were the pets to have i remember hearing about this many boa constrictors in an episode before uh, there were also two puppies loose in the house according to former head of homicide Stuart cook the police got a call that the couple hadn't been seen in a while and neighbors were concerned front door was open officers testified the house was ransacked drawers open contents thrown around you know bed stripped of sheets Two guns stolen from the house. On the evening of October 22nd, the Briley's and Duncan Meekins are now finally arrested. Uh, Sheriff C.T. Woody Jr. ended up chasing Linwood Briley as he wove through traffic. 
thought it was strange how, as he chased him, Linwood always seemed to stay one step ahead of him. Prosecutor Robert Rice, also in the vehicle following Linwood, said every time we'd make a conversation that they were turning right, they would turn left. And we'd say they're turning left uh, because they were given the signal and then they would turn right. Finally, we just had enough of it. I said, just, just put them into the pole or into a pole. L- they did. Linwood jumped out of the car, leaving his father and Duncan uh, inside the car after crashing into a utility pole. And then the police later found a scanner inside, which explained how Linwood was able to outmaneuver them, right? He would hear them talking about what they were <laughs> about to do and he would do the opposite. Linwood ended up being chased down uh, and then surrendered before being shot dead in the street. After their arrest, Duncan Meekin said Linwood told the police, uh, you know, uh, Linwood, I'm sorry. After their arrest, Duncan Meekins and Linwood Briley were told that the police were investigating the Barton Avenue murders. Duncan was a minor, so he was not questioned until his parents arrived. Uh, The officers gave Duncan a summary of his and the Briley's movements before and after the murders and described the crime scene. They took off Duncan's shoes, which they suspected he wore on the night of the murders, leaving prints and the blood at the house. Duncan's parents encouraged him to tell the truth. He gave a statement admitting he was there with the Briley's. And then the next day he got a lawyer. And on October 25th, he made a detailed confession where he admitted to killing Harvey and implicated himself in the Briley's and the robbery, murders, and rapes. And Duncan then proceeded in an attempt to keep himself off a of death row to detail all the other crimes they had committed, including many the police didn't think they were responsible for. Also revealed that James went back into the Barton Avenue house after the murders to steal a TV, which is fucking crazy. To head back into that bloodbath because you want to get a TV to what? Sell to a pawn shop? James and Anthony soon turned themselves in at the Richmond Police Headquarters. The arrest of this crew in connection to these murders is what made the cover of the October 23rd, 1979 issue of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Three men, juvenile, held in three Northside deaths. Detective Gaudet later said the group didn't seem to think the police had any evidence against them and were unwilling to talk shortly after their arrest. He told Linwood, this is serious. You could get the electric chair. And he said that Linwood threw up his arms and said, I'll take it like a man. Didn't seem bothered at all. Showed no fear, no remorse, no fear. Every group member charged with the Barton Avenue murders and many other charges will soon follow. Like so many charges. Uh, John Gallagher's friend and uh, former detective Leroy Morgan helped with the in- interrogation. At the uh, at that point, no one knew that the Briley's had killed Johnny G. But then Morgan noticed a turquoise ring on Linwood's finger. And he recognized it as John's ring because he was with John when he bought that fucking ring. How surreal. Morgan later told the Richmond Times Dispatch, I'm not a violent person, but I sure could have, well, it wouldn't have taken much for me to have jumped him. Yeah, I bet he knows now that that motherfucker killed his friend. John Gallagher's watch uh, found in the Briley house, more incriminating evidence. Linwood charged with John Gallagher's murder. According to an affidavit, Linwood admitted that he was in Gallagher's vehicle, admitted to stealing a CB radio antenna, wheel cover, jumper cables, and the ring, but, you know, didn't murder him. October 26, 1979, Linwood is charged with capital murder for the death of Charles Garner and murder uh, for the death of Blanche Page. Also charged with robbing Charles Garner and the rape of Judy Barton. Same day, James and Anthony charged with the murder of John Gallagher. Both James and Anthony charged with abducting and robbing Gallagher and use of a firearm in commission of a felony. James additionally charged with raping Judy Barton. November 1st, Anthony, Linwood, and James charged with the murder of Mary Wilfong. Uh, each charged with capital murder and robbery. Linwood and Anthony also charged for the attack on William and Virginia Butcher. Uh, charged with attempted murder, arson, breaking and entering with intent to commit robbery, and two counts using a firearm in commission of a robbery. November 20th, Duncan Meekins testifies that he shot Harvey Wilkerson as part of a deal he made with prosecutors to confess to his crimes, but also testify against the Briley brothers in exchange for a guarantee that he would not get the death penalty. He admitted to raping Judy Barton, Meekins gave almost four hours of testimony. After hearing Meekins' testimony, a judge certified the following charges to a grand jury. Linwood Briley, five counts of murder, three counts of robbery, four counts of using firearms in the commission of felonies, one charge of rape. James Briley, three counts of murder, four counts of using weapons in the commission of felonies, one count of robbery, one charge of rape. Anthony Briley, three counts of murder, four counts of using firearms in the commission of felonies, one count of robbery. And then Duncan Meekins charged with the murder of John Gallagher. And they each had committed a lot more crimes than these. These were just the crimes the state had the most evidence for at that time. And, you know, these crimes uh, charges were more than enough to send this crew to death row or prison for life. 
Linwood Briley's trial for the Barton Avenue murders started on January 10th, 1980, the first of so fucking many trials. I've never come across so many trials in an episode. Uh, Duncan testified that Linwood was not present when the murders took uh, murders took place, but said that Linwood and his brothers planned to rob Harvey. Uh, January 12th, 1980, Linwood found guilty of the Barton Avenue murders and received five life sentences. Also found guilty of using a firearm during five felonies and received five one-year sentences. Chose not to make a statement before his sentencing. January 18th, Linwood found guilty of more shit. Guilty of two counts of first-degree murder for the murders of Blanche Page and Charles Garner. Receives uh, a life sentence. The jury deliberated for two days and chose not to convict him of capital murder, which meant he would not receive the death penalty for this, uh, you know, for these charges. Also found guilty of robbery and sentenced to 20 years in prison with an additional one-year sentence for using a firearm in the commission of a robbery. When asked if he wanted to speak, he said, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. That's all. And then the judge said, wait, what was that? And he just repeated, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. That's all. And the judge was like, hold on, hold on. Are you telling me you're, you're guilty or that you're not guilty? And he was just like, I'm not guilty. And, uh, and that's when the judge let him go. He's like, why didn't you just say that at the beginning? You silly old goose. We don't put not guilty people in jail. Gosh dang, get out of here. Go on, get. <laughs> Run along, you silly little rascal. No, Jackie, of course. Uh, James Bradley's capital murder trial started on January 23rd, 1980, facing four counts of capital murder for the Barton Avenue murders. James claimed that on the night of the murders, he was at home except for a couple of instances when he went to the store. But then on January 24th, Duncan Meekins revealed what he claimed was the truth, said that James shot Harvey Barton. Meekins said he withheld the info because he feared for his younger sister. Uh, Richard W. Meekins, fucking Dick Meekins. Thank God we finally got some dick. Uh, His father spoke in court about a threatening letter he received about his daughter. Meekins said that he had not always told the truth and tried to help James by withholding information. He testified that he was in the house when two more shots were fired and heard one more as he fled when previously he said he heard a shot while looking outside. And when he turned around, saw James standing over Judy with a pistol. In the original story, James told him to get one and he shot Harvey. Uh, He fled, heard more gunshots than he was uh, when he was outside. Next day, January 25th, James Briley found guilty. Two counts of capital murder. And the jury voted to impose the death penalty. James also found guilty of first degree murder, robbery, rape, and five counts of using a firearm during the commission of a felony Jury sentenced him to life, 40 years, 20 years, and one year for the firearm offenses. As James was let out of court, he made a gesture with his right hand and said, thanks, y'all. <laughs> Weird. Posed for a photographer and said, you be sure to tell the man that I didn't do it. Someone else did. And the brothers are going to find him. Said the brothers, like they're some fucking band of righteous vigilantes. February 19th, jury is selected for the capital murder trial of Linwood Briley for the murder of John Gallagher. Right, still being tried for more crimes. February 21st, found guilty. Linwood is of capital murder. Next day, February 22nd, jury votes to impose the death penalty on him as well. The boy's father, James Briley Sr., pleads guilty now to uh, to obstruction of justice on February 26, 1980 for his testimony at a pretrial hearing. He received a 12-month jail sentence suspended for two years. Uh, During that hearing, he testified that he, he told police his sons paid rent, which was not true. And this was important because if they had paid rent, then James Sr.'s permission to the police to search their rooms without a warrant, you know, might not have been valid. March 4th, 1980, the judge affirms the jury's death penalty for James Briley. And now James says in court, I'll always say I didn't do it. I'll always know I didn't. March 10th, judge affirms the death penalty for Linwood. Another jury was then selected on March 18th for Anthony Briley's murder trial. So many fucking trials. March 19th, 1980, Anthony Briley found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder for the Barton Avenue murders. The jury fixed his punishment as 109 years in prison, 30 years for each murder, 15 years for robbery, four one-year sentences for the use of a firearm. Anthony told the judge that he was convicted of something I did not do, a crime I did not commit. Yeah, they're all innocent. They're always innocent, you know? All three brothers were framed time and time and time again in trial after trial after trial. Uh, Duncan Meekins testified that Anthony ransacked the Wilkerson apartment and was present during the murders. Prosecution argued that Anthony was just as guilty as the others. April 30th, 1980, the judge upholds the verdicts in Anthony Briley's case. He's sentenced to 109 years in prison for all his convictions. Will be eligible for parole, though, after just a dozen years. But then there's more stuff coming. Mar- uh, May 27th, murderer, uh, murder and robbery charges are certified against all three Briley brothers for the death of Mary Wilfong in Henrico County. Linwood charged with capital murder and robbery. 
James and Anthony charged with first-degree murder and robbery. 16 charges against Anthony and Linwood from the butcher March 1979 incident are dismissed. They have more than enough charges to go around. <laughs> June 23rd, 1980, jury selection completed for Anthony Briley's trial in the John Gallagher case. It fucking continues. More trials, more juries. I will say all these trials were quick, though. Uh, testimony showed that Anthony did not kill Gallagher, but according to Meekins, he participated in planning an abduction. June 24th, Anthony found guilty of murder and abduction. This uh, new jury gives him a life sentence plus 10 years. So now that whole possibility of parole in a dozen years, well, that's, that's fucking shit on. That's gone. Anthony told the judge, I just like to say that I'm not guilty and I will always know that I didn't do the crimes I've been charged with. Okay, yeah, thanks for speaking out. That's, that's great. That adds a lot to this. Linwood Briley's trial for the murder of Mary Wolfong starts August uh, 19th, 1980. I can't remember another case in a situation where all the crimes occurred in the same damn state where there were so many fucking trials for the same series of crimes. Uh, guessing it's because, uh, you know, there were four different perpetrators involved in a lot of different crimes. And if you tried everything together in one case, it would just overwhelm and confuse the jury. Linwood's defense argued that he was home with his family, playing cards with friends and neighbors when Mary was killed and that he went to the state fair later that evening, but he, uh, he didn't. <laughs> Another alibi falls apart. Duncan testifies against him. And then September 4th, Linwood Briley found guilty of capital murder. Robbery in this case, sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years for robbery. A uh, jury would have reached this verdict sooner, but there was a two-week continuance because the defense witness got sick. Uh, and now, <laughs> can you guess what's coming up next? Yes, another trial. But don't worry, it's almost over. And way more interesting shit is coming up soon afterwards. Anthony Briley went to trial for first-degree murder and robbery, in this case, September 23rd, 1980. September 25th, Anthony found guilty of robbery, acquitted of the first-degree murder, and gets a, another 20-year sentence tacked on to all the other shit. James Briley set to go to trial for this case now, October 1980, but he waves a jury trial. He's just like, well, I'm fucking done. Come on. Uh, October 28th, James convicted of first-degree murder and robbery. Received two consecutive 20-year terms, added to everything else. October 29th, Anthony Briley sentenced to 20 years for robbery by a judge, bringing his total prison time to life plus another 139 years. And he got the least amount of sentencing uh, for the brothers. November 14th, 1980, Duncan Meekins pleads guilty to robbery and murder in Henrico County. Sentenced to 20 years for robbery. Life sentence for murder suspended indefinitely. Almost done with this section. But first, <laughs> January 29th, 1981. Now 17-year-old Duncan Meekins pleads guilty to three murders and robbery. Right, Sentenced to life in prison plus 80 years as part of his plea agreement. Uh, Meekins pled guilty to the murders of Harvey Wilkerson, Charles Garner, and John Gallagher, and to the robbery of Harvey Wilkerson will be eligible for parole after 13 and a half years. But then Richmond Circuit Judge James B. Wilkinson initially rejects the plea bargain because it called for a suspended sentence for one of the murder convictions and said, I'm not going to give a suspended sentence for the vilest rampage of rape, murder, and robbery the court has seen in 30 years. The agreement was updated to include 30-year sentences for two murders. As part of his plea deal, Meekins taken to an undisclosed state to serve out his sentence under a fake name. And why was that happening? Well, because he was worried with very good reason that the Briley brothers were going to have him killed in prison for testifying against them. And now we are fucking finally done <laughs> with the trial stuff and getting to another especially interesting part of this case. May 31st, 1984, Linwood and James Briley, along with four other inmates, attempt to escape from the Mecklenburg Correctional Center. At that time, this place was Virginia's toughest maximum security prison a place thought to be virtually impossible to escape from a place built specifically to quote uh, the uh, to house quote the worst of the worst at the opening ceremony 1976 governor mills e godwin jr stated that the facility served as a monument to failure as the inmates to be housed there were viewed as the most incorrigible and likely unable to be returned to a free society the other escape uh, uh, you know or inmates who attempt escape uh, included Lem Tuggle Jr., Earl Clanton Jr., a lot of juniors, Derek Peterson, and Willie Leroy Jones. And they would collectively be called the Mecklen Mecklenburg Six. Lem Tuggle had been sentenced to death for the rape and capital murder of a woman in 1983. In 1971, he had strangled a girl and went to prison, then was released on parole just months before the 1983 murder. Uh, Willie Leroy Jones murdered an elderly couple, Graham and Myra Adkins, May 13th, 1983. Derek Peterson killed a grocery store manager during a 1982 robbery. And Earl Clanton murdered an elementary school librarian in 1980. 
thought that he killed her when she refused to tell him where the wizard fireball scrolls from the Library of Alexandria were hidden. Or he killed a 38-year-old school librarian in a burglary where he got eight fucking dollars. This was the second time he'd been involved in a robbery where somebody got killed. One of the escape uh, conspirators, uh, death row inmate Dennis Stockton, would decline to go with the group because he uh, had new evidence showing that he was not guilty of the murder that put him on death row. Stockton was on death row for committing the murder for hire of a 17-year-old boy. Uh, He had escaped from other correctional facilities before, but then obviously been captured. Many details about the escape attempt will come from Stockton's diary. He should have tried to leave with the other six because the new evidence would not end up exonerating him and he will be executed via lethal injection in 1995. Uh, Details from his diary corroborated by investigators reported to the, or reported by the Richmond Times Dispatch. Here are some details. Some guards responsible for the control room that maintained access to death row cells would open the control room door if an inmate wanted to pass an item to someone in another section of the two-story cell block known as the C-Pod in Building 1. Like, he would basically write a lot about how he was getting a little loosey-goosey. A bathroom door sometimes unlocked adjoined the control room area, meaning that prisoners who filed in or out of the tier could duck into the bathroom unnoticed at times. If inmates returning from recreation weren't ordered to go directly to their cells, it was easy to create confusion over headcounts while they milled about, chatted, or darted from one cell to another. The prison's five match buildings were full of stairwell hiding places, blocked lines of sight, and prison yard obstructions. Its design, once hailed as state-of-the-art, was described after the escape by politicians and experts alike as archaic. Uh, The bathroom door being unlocked near the control room will be a key part of the uh, escape plan. In late 1983, one of uh, James Briley's female friends was caught trying to sneak him a loaded revolver. She was arrested. Now there was word of an escape plan floating around the prison. This almost kills their escape attempt. Probably should have, but didn't. Harold Catron, uh, assistant warden at Mecklenburg in 1984, approached the warden and told him that he needed to lock the inmates up. They were locked up for two weeks, but the director said they had to be released uh, to the cell block after that. Around the time of the escape, there was uh, a lot of legal actions being taken by prisoners' rights advocates that ended up decreasing confinement levels for inmates. Harold told the Richmond Times Dispatch, it was unbelievable to me that we were in a position of having to allow death row inmates to congregate with one another up until 10, 11 p.m. at night in the day room. That's how the Briley's were able to operate to gain control of what was going on. Two Briley brothers and four others would soon try and escape even after the inmates, uh, some of them, other, other inmates, warned prison staff that they were trying to break out. April of 1984, lawyer J. Lloyd Snook, representing four of these other inmates, told lawyers in the state attorney general's office about the escape attempt in detail. Death row was then put on lockdown from late April to late May, but officers didn't find any of the contraband that Snook had mentioned. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was it was over. The lockdown ended. Uh, then another inmate, Dennis Stockton, warned prison staff about the escape, trying to gain favor or something. Assistant Warden Harold, uh, again, wanted to extend the lockdown in this situation, but told no. So while all this is going on, Linwood and James Briley, uh, they are running shit in death row. I mentioned earlier how, uh, you know, they're all about toughness and they were fucking tough. People consistently just wanted to please Linwood, even guards. And people were scared of Linwood and James, even the guards. According to Joe Jackson, author of Life on Death Row in America, Linwood and James were running a successful drug business before their escape attempt. Guards would bring uh, the drugs in (laughs) and they would have fellow inmates sell the drugs to both inmates and other guards. It's crazy to me. Dennis Stockton's diary, uh, I guess not totally crazy after watching a lot of prison documentaries over the years. But man, the the level of planning and patience and sneakiness to to make this work. Uh, Dennis Dockton's diary would reveal uh, what was going on in death row. Somehow the Briley's even managed to start growing weed in their death row cells. (laughs) How the fuck? I've never heard of that one before. Uh, Also had an information and supply network inside the prison. The Times Dispatch reported Linwood Briley, Stockton related, uh, had a mesmerizing control over other inmates. James was a proudly nervous enforcer according to Stockton, and post-escape investigative findings. Lieutenant James Lettner, head of general investigations for the State Police Bureau of Criminal Investigation, who later wrote a report on the escape attempt, noted a lack of communication between admin and guards. He called the death row officers some of the most grossly incompetent people I have ever come across. He didn't hold back. What they allowed to happen was just remarkable to me. Uh, He did note we never turned up any indication that there were any sort of conspiracy between the Briley's and the guards, though. I'm convinced that didn't happen. They were just incompetent. 
James Bradley would talk about the escape attempt later in April of 1985. He said they planned it for two full years. He said that he and Linwood spent time developing friendships with guards. It was more or less using their own system and turning it against them, he said. He said the officers were just computerized to do certain things. The inmates planned their escape by studying officers and their procedures. They ended up crafting weapons, some serious weapons out of some lawn equipment as well. Uh, they drew out maps. They drew out a series of steps and waited for the perfect moment. May 31st, 1984, the moment has arrived. That day, the six inmates that were going to try and escape shaved their heads so they could look like guards when they tried to make a run for it. There were 24 men on death row at that time. About 12 were apparently aware of this escape plan. Stockton documented a conversation between himself and inmate Lem Tuggle on the evening of the escape attempt. He said, Tuggle, Tuggle told him, we're going to leave tonight and I need to know how to get away from here. Can you tell me which roads run into North Carolina and where they are? Tuggle was anxious about being forced to drive the getaway vehicle. That night between 8 and 8.30, most of the death row inmates gathered in front of the threshold of C-Pod, which was a section of death row. The guards working that night did not do a head count. Pretty big fuck up. Inmate Earl Clanton Jr. snuck into the control room restroom, that unlocked door, and then locked it. When a nurse then tried to go into the bathroom and get some water to give out to uh, some inmates for their medications, she complains about the locked door. That's when James Briley set the plan into motion, according to Stockton's diary. Briley told the control room guards that he overheard someone else saying that the plumbing wasn't working. So the guards now decide to send the nurse somewhere else to get some water. Around 9 p.m., James asked a guard to get him a book. Books were uh, kept in a day room next to the control room. When the control room door was open to go access the day room, James Briley then called out with a signal to Earl Clanton, who'd been hiding in the bathroom. He now pops out of the bathroom, overpowers the guard in the control room. And then Clanton opens every fucking cell door on death row. The guards working in that area are quickly overpowered. This is terrifying. If you're working, stripped of their uniforms, taped up and restrained. The six inmates making a break for it now pick uniforms that fit them best and put them on. Soon, some additional guards enter the, the block because they're worried about a recent lack of communication. They haven't heard anything. They're overpowered and taken hostage. This shit's crazy. James Briley, because he was a fucking psychopath, like his brother Linwood, now decides he wants to pour rubbing alcohol on some of the guards and set them on fire. But another inmate, Willie Lloyd Turner, stops him. Linwood now decides he wants to rape the nurse. Of course that crazy fuck did. Uh, but inmate Wilbert Lee Evans stops him. Well, this incident inside this block lasts for about 90 minutes. Uh, the warden, during this time, has no idea shit has gone horribly wrong on death row. When a prisoner then manages to trick a lieutenant uh, into thinking that he's a guard and overpowering the lieutenant, the six guys going for it are able now to get out of death row. Now with a knife against his throat, the lieutenant is forced to request a van. Also informs the guard that the death row inmates had a bomb and they needed a van to transport the bomb out of the prison for safety issues, obviously. So now a guard quickly drives the van over. The six inmates, meanwhile, they put on riot gear. They've gotten a hold of helmets, gas masks, and shields. The group next needs to get out of building one where the main control room is located. A female guard outside of building one receives a message that there is an outside call. The lieutenant tells the guard that someone is on the way uh, to cover the control room while she takes the call. The guard opens the door, sees someone walking towards her. Inmate Derek L. Peterson, one of the six, right, disguised, now overpowers her and calls James, uh, you know, Riley, right? Let's burn all these motherfuckers alive, Riley. The group runs out of building one with the fake bomb on a gurney now, covered by a blanket. It was actually a TV covered by a blanket and two inmates kept spraying it with uh, fire extinguishers, right, for dramatic effect. They put the bomb in the van. They order the guard to open the doors uh, to let the van out of the facility. She initially refuses, but eventually they convince her to do it. Remarkably, no one is seriously injured during this escape attempt. And the group reportedly stole 758 bucks in cash from some of the guards and made off with a bunch of the weed that they were fucking growing somehow in prison. Uh, and did I say escape attempt earlier? No, they made it out. All six guys. It is the biggest death row prison escape to this day in U.S. history. Records manager Jerry Davis later said this about the escape. It was a freak happening. They walked out. They did not break out. You have to remember that. It took human error for them to escape. Well, they just drove the fuck on out of prison at 10.47 p.m. In disguises. State police reporter noted that the prison command did not learn about the escape for another 30 minutes until 11.15 p.m. You know, 28 minutes if you're counting the minutes exactly. And then, more of a fuck up, state police not notified until after 11.30 p.m. by the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office, not the prison. So these six murderers have uh, around a 45-minute head start. Governor not notified until between 1.30 and 2 a.m. 
the entire city of Richmond terrified when news comes out about the escape the following morning. The general public didn't uh, know what the Bradleys were up to when they were killing, but now they had known the truth about them for years. And now two of the three brothers, the worst two by far, are loose. Many people purchase guns in the coming days. Those associated with the trials of the killers or relatives and friends of victims are offered police protection. Uh, after the escape, this is so fucked up, but it is funny to me. At, right after the escape, one of Warren Von Shook's neighbors put up a sign uh, that said, Von Shook lies over there with an arrow pointing to Warren's house. Von Shook was a Richmond assistant Commonwealth attorney and lead prosecutor. <laughs> In the Riley murder case. That's so fucked up. But also kind of funny. Like, what if you hated one of your neighbors and then some murderer with an axe to grind against them escapes from death row? Like, would you be tempted to help him find him? Like, like if that happened now, it, it feels like it would take place on social media, just like with like a series of TikTok videos or something. Just please share this video, everybody. Uh, uh, Linwood. Uh, Linwood, if you're watching, Warren lives at 4367 Walnut Avenue. Split level rancher. His bedroom window is on the northeast side of the building. Uh, facing the backyard. He's asleep by 11 p.m. every night. Leaves the garage unlocked. Has guns. Keeps all of them locked up. Hasn't been in the range in years. Ammo boxes are covered in dust. You fucking got this, dude. I love you. Let's fucking go. Share this video. <laughs> 2019. Eight News will speak uh, with three of the officers who were working during the prison escape. Former correctional officer Prince Thomas. Former shift commander. Larry Hawkins, and Officer Coraline Epps. After the inmates put uh, on the guards' uniforms, they radioed officers in other areas of the prison, bringing them to the control room. Larry Hawkins said, when I got up to the top of the stairway, I saw an inmate I knew, and he had an officer uniform on. So as I turned to go back down the steps, that's when I met James Briley Cohen up the steps. He had a shank, put it to my neck, said if I tried anything, he would kill me. This is like, this is like something out of a movie. I can't believe a movie has been made about all this. Officer Prince Thomas told 8 News, when I get up there, I see inmate Joe Garantano in the control room. I knew something was wrong. I ran back down the stairs. James Briley and Lem Tuggle came up behind me with shanks. Shanks around my neck, through my legs. Thomas also saw Linwood Briley with a fucking lawnmower blade. Made a machete out of a lawn tool he took from the yard. Of course he did. He's the fucking Negan of death row. Holding his Lucille now. Uh, Linwood said, if I thought you were lying, I'd kill you now. They undressed him, took off his uniform. He saw other officers lined up on the steps. Officer Thomas said that they were all locked up in a closet behind the shower, right? This is like the, the fucking Purge movie set in this uh, prison. Officer Epps, uh, overpowered in the control room. She was terrified that the inmates were going to rape her and murder her. She was thinking about her newborn baby at home. She was taken to a room, uh, but their inmate, Earl Clanton, prevented anyone from raping her. He told her he was a father and said, I'm not going to let anyone come in here and hurt you. You have my word. Earl, following being captured after escaping, uh, will still be executed in the electric chair in 1988 for strangling a neighbor in a 1980 robbery. Interviewed over 35 years later, some of these officers still traumatized by what had happened to them. Officer Epps said that she had to take anxiety medication, had difficulty sleeping. Officer Thomas said he hadn't slept through the night since 1984. Officers also criticized by their colleagues dealt with that stress. Officer Epps said, I felt very underappreciated or unappreciated. Because I didn't give up my life. I was being blamed. They didn't care if we lived or died. They put me on a lie detector test and tried to say I was part of the escape and I had failed the polygraph and let me go. Five officers were fired after the escape. Epps was one of them. Hawkins and Thomas questioned for several days, but, you know, not fired. But I will say, you know, a lot of sources talk about how, yeah, it's terrible what happened to these guards, but also that they were fucking completely incompetent and not good at their jobs on any level. Uh, Derek Peterson and Earl Clinton were caught quick. They were found in a laundromat in Warrington, North Carolina, the next day, June 1st. Their prison shoes gave them away. Fucking idiots! <laughs> you can escape from death row, but you can't just, like, go barefoot or steal some shoes from a thrift store or something real, real quick. Uh, police also found the stolen prison van that day. Right, They ditched it, stole some other vehicles. Uh, a week later, June 8th, Lem Tuggle, the van driver, captured in Woodford, Vermont, by a local police officer after he pulled a knife on a gift store clerk in a robbery. He made it quite a ways, distance-wise. Tuggle confessed that they got uh, out of the stolen truck in Philadelphia. Tuggle also said he saw the Brileys stuff their stolen uniforms into a tree hollow there and then admitted to driving Willie Jones up to the border. Then Willie was arrested a few hours later in Vermont, just a few miles from the Canadian border. Fucking almost free Willie. Almost makes it. Why would Lem rat on him? He was going to go back to death row anyway, whether he ratted or not. He was still going to be executed whether he ratted or not. He was executed by the state in 1996. Uh, wonder if Willie ever found out, you know, what he did. Willie was fried in the electric chair in 1992. 
The Briley brothers, they're still on the loose. Police started surveillance of the Briley's friends and relatives after the escape, paying close attention to the Briley's uncle, Johnny Lee Council, who lived on the north side of Philadelphia. After getting the, you know, the Philly details from uh, Lem Rat Tuggle about stealing a truck in Philly and the Briley stuff in prison, prison uniforms into that tree hollow. The FBI gathered information about the relatives in the area through prison records. FBI spent the days leading up to the uh, arrest, stalking out Council's home and repair shop. On June 19th, 1984, nearly three weeks after escaping, they do arrest James and Linwood Briley in Philly. Please find the Briley's by tapping phone lines. An uh, unidentified individual in New York was under surveillance at that time. They got a phone call that was traced to an auto repair garage in North Philly. An FBI informant sent out to check out the garage. June 19th, he saw two men who sure looked a lot like Linwood and James Briley. James and Linwood uh, were active in the neighborhood, which is crazy to me. James uh, gave himself the nickname of Slim. Uh, Linwood, lucky, just slim and lucky, just fucking around in Philly. What could, what could, what could go wrong? James and Linwood listened to media coverage of their escape with the garage owner, Dan Latham, who didn't know their real identities, but that's pretty ballsy because they showed their pictures on the news. They were recaptured in Philly by the FBI, 9.51 p.m. They were caught grilling chicken in the alley, like in an alley behind their uncle's house. They were completely surprised, but arrested without incident. Guys, grilling chicken in an alley at almost 10 at night on a Tuesday. You, You just can't fucking let your uncle grill it for you for the next day? Or, you know, wait for the next day or something. I mean, smart enough to escape, but just kind of arrogant, it feels like. Like, they just couldn't lay low for a few months. Just thought they could just be out in the open and outsmart people. Like, why didn't they stay inside? You know, hollow out part of the floor or something. Watch TV, grow some weed to sell later to help your uncle. Maybe try and sneak into Canada. Something other than grilling chicken in a fucking alley. Just a few weeks after breaking out. June 20th, their uncle Johnny Council charged with harboring criminals. James Briley said as he walked past reporters on the night of his arrest, I am innocent and that's it. I want to talk to the governor. I am innocent of everything that was done in Virginia. And then Linwood Briley said, much ado about Satan. Yes, tis I, Billy Shakes, the ghost of William Shakespeare, the world's most diabolical killer. Returned from the grave once again. You can arrest the body, but you can never confine my dark and tormented soul. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women, merely actors, waiting for me, Billy Shakes, to write their tortured roles and death scenes in the most fiendish of all horror plays. The bodies will continue to fall. And then he snapped out of a trance and was like, wait, what? The fuck are you, Peckerworth, looking at? Uh, No, he didn't say anything. I'm not sure if anyone other than me Likes the recurring uh, Billy Shakes gag, but still makes me chuckle. Uh, after Linwood and James were recaptured, they were ordered to be held on $10 million bail. Johnny Lee Council's bail set at a million dollars. Uh, once returned to Virginia, there would be no more grown weed in their cells. No more, no more running death row. No more hanging out with other inmates at 11 p.m. Everything had changed. Shit locked down way tighter now. New cameras installed in a bunch of places. A whole bunch of upgrades. Better guards. And then they will quickly be killed. Caught on June 19th, 1984, 30 year old Linwood Briley executed by the electric chair less than four months later, October 12th, 1984, pronounced dead at 11.05 p.m. Uh, his mother, Bertha, visited her son, allowed to hug him before he died. His brother, James, wanted to stay with his brother right up until his death, had to be shocked twice with a stun gun so he could be taken away. He said, I told him I wouldn't leave my brother, I wouldn't walk out. Linwood's final meal was a steak, baked potato, peas, salad, rolls with butter, cake, peaches, punch, and milk. 19 inmates signed a petition to stage a hunger strike to try and protest his execution to try and save him, but 11 of them, you know, quickly gave up on it, which I get. I mean, it's death row. Food's one of the last pleasures you have there. Probably not going to like want to skip out a bunch of meals. Uh, There were 500 demonstrators for and against the death penalty outside the prison, the NAACP, Linwood's attorney. A uh, black minister's group petitioned Governor Charles Robb to spare him, but the governor did not halt the execution, and the Supreme Court refused four times to hear appeals. Deborah Wyatt, Linwood's defense attorney, told the press, he made it a little easier on everyone by being exceedingly brave, and he maintained his innocence. Those were his last words. However, Richmond PD's head of homicide, Stuart Cook, said he was not brave. He was a coward in his final moments. He said that Linwood had to be sedated and carried to the electric chair because he was so afraid to die. I'm surprised that doesn't happen more more often, actually. Like, why make it easy for them to kill you? But I guess also, I mean, you know, fight as much as you want. It's 
still going to happen. A little over six months later, March 28th, 1985, weeks before he was executed, James Briley gets married. He marries 44-year-old Evangeline Grant Redding, a writer and activist, like anti-death penalty activist. Uh, Evangeline was a former broadcast journalist with 10 years of experience in public television, uh, had been a freelance writer since 1976, divorced with four kids. She hoped the marriage would add credibility to her efforts to win Briley's release from prison. Wedding took place in James' cell with Evangeline standing outside. She told the Associated Press, we held hands. I even got a few kisses. Oh, how fucking lovely. Conjugal visits, not allowed, but she gave James some boudoir uh, photos, according to authors Jack Rosewood and Dwayne Walker in their 2015 book about this. So, you know, he got to he got to jerk off to something special for his honeymoon. Uh, not sure he deserved that at all. Uh, Evangeline said about her new husband, he's a fantastic person. Is he? He's gorgeous, charming, and intelligent. He lights up my life. He's six foot four and 190 pounds. Imagine a woman my age marrying someone like that. <laughs> Fuck is going on here, Lucifina? She said she believed James was innocent because he says he's innocent. <laughs> okay, that's all it took for her. Why do you think he's innocent? Oh, uh, he said so. He told me he was. These guys never lie. Guys on death row never lie about being guilty or innocent, ever. Uh, she did say, though, he says he's innocent and I would soon believe him as racist authorities. And you know, historically, she does have a case there. Evangeline became interested in the Briley brothers back in 1979, started writing to James after Linwood was executed and fell in love with him in January or February of 1985. Uh, what happened to her and her upbringing that would lead to that possibility? Uh, she told the Associated Press that she planned to write a book about James and argue that he was a victim of a police conspiracy because the brothers had criminal records and could just be blamed randomly for unsolved murders. Evangeline convinced that James would not be executed because he was innocent. Uh, but, you know, he was, he was not innocent. He was, he was found guilty, if you, if you recall, in a lot of different trials by a lot of different juries. A few days before the wedding, March 25th, 1985, the Supreme Court refused to consider James's case for a second time. Evangeline said after the Supreme Court refusal, we are going to seek a new trial for him based on the fact that he is innocent. I think if this country really stands for justice and freedom for all, we are eventually going to see him walk out freely and not be executed. Uh, James would keep a scrapbook of newspaper articles about the Briley brothers' crimes, and James used this scrapbook as a reference to support for an appeal for a retrial. The appeal stated, Defendant claims that the lower court erred in denying his motion for a change of venue or in the alternative, a change of veneer. veneer. Uh, in support of his motion, the defendant filed a notebook containing over 70 articles from three Richmond newspapers, which he says unduly emphasized his criminal record and his connection with other crimes allegedly committed by him, his brothers, and Meekins. Interestingly, Governor Robb's assistants reported that the office received over a 1,000 letters asking for clemency for Linwood, but only 216 for James. Well, 28-year-old uh, 28 year old James Briley would be executed April 18th, 1985, in the same electric chair that his brother died in. The very last minute, James' attorneys were, re uh, his, his appeals were rejected by federal judge D. Dorch Warner, they presented the testimony of a female prisoner who said that another gang member committed the Barton Avenue murders, but the judge rejected her testimony as being unreliable. And one last flash of Briley brother related bloodshed. Other inmates at the prison on the night of his execution tried to disrupt it with the prison uprising. Uh, 17 prisoners. Oh, I'm sorry. It was the morning of execution. This happened is where it started. Not the evening. 17 prisoners involved in the melee. Four inmates wore pillowcases over their heads, used clubs, screwdrivers, and more to uh, try and drag some poor guard into a cell. Nine guards, one inmate would end up getting stabbed and beaten. Four guards would have to have surgery for stab wounds. Inmates broke cell windows uh, and then were subdued after James was executed. And then he was pronounced dead at 11.07 p.m. His final meal, fried shrimp and a soft drink. Uh, Kathy King, prison operations officer, told the AP he had no final statement. He just smiled and asked the witnesses twice, are you happy? Catherine Allen, a Richmond Sheriff's Department employee and a witness to the execution, said, I had to stop and think about the people that were killed. They wanted to live. The unborn baby didn't have a chance to be born. The little boy didn't have a chance to grow up. It, the execution, is a sad thing to have to be done, but it did have to be done. Evangeline Briley did not attend the execution, but did visit James that afternoon. She praised the inmates for their uprising, saying, We're very sorry you were hurt in the process, but this is what happens when a state acts in a violent manner. They are planning on committing a violent crime against James Briley tonight. Violence breeds violence. Six days before the execution, Shirley Barton Hayes, victim Judy Barton's mother, told the Richmond News uh, uh, ledger that she didn't think James would be executed. 
I wish that James Briley would confess that he did it so his soul would be right with God. Life in prison, that would give him something to think about the rest of his life. Give him try, time to try and get his mind together. Uh, Shirley said on April 19th, 1985, the day after his ex, James's execution, that she would sue Evangeline Briley for any money she might earn from any book she might write about the Briley brothers. Doesn't seem that she ended up writing any, any books. Not about that. Uh, skipping way ahead now, June 17th, 2009. Former assistant Commonwealth prosecuting attorney, Robert J. Rice, now a criminal defense attorney, and Warren Von Shook attended a closed meeting with Rudolph C. McCollum, former mayor of Richmond and member of the Virginia Parole Board, and, the, and they spoke on behalf of now 45-year-old Duncan Meekins, emphasized that his testimony might have stopped the murder spree in the sense that, you know, uh, had he not testified, the Briley brothers might have been able to get away uh, with some of their crimes, get some innocent verdicts, and be back on the streets. Meekins was being considered for parole at the time. Uh, he had now spent almost 30 years in prison, held at a facility outside Virginia under a fake name. Uh, Robert Jones, though, Harvey Wilkerson's nephew, contacted the parole board to oppose this release. Robert said he had planned to visit the Wilkerson's two days before they were murdered, but had tonsillitis and said he believed that if, if he would have visited, he would have been killed as well. You know, uh, August 13th, 2009, the Virginia Parole Board denies parole to Duncan, citing the seriousness of his crimes. This was the seventh time Meekins was denied parole since 1993. Due to him uh, being held under an A-list, hard to tell what's going on with him right now. From everything I can tell, he is still incarcerated somewhere, but no real news about him since 2009. 2013, real estate developer David Dagenhart Jr. purchases the Briley's old childhood home, 3117 uh, uh, 4th Avenue from James Briley Sr., Dagenhart claimed he didn't know the house's history until October 28th, 2014. Dagenhart planned to remodel the home, but lost heart when the Richmond Times Dispatch reported about it. In October 2014, he told WTVR that he just wanted to get rid of the house and was only asking now $29,000 for it. Someone bought it Halloween 2017 for 60 grand, sold it to someone else December 17th, 2018 for 90 grand. Then that person clearly put a lot of work into it, flipped it, Sold it for three hundred fifteen thousand on May twenty fourth, two thousand twenty one. Looks fucking great now, but I do wonder if whoever is living there knows its history. Uh, today, using Virginia's inmate locator, the youngest, last remaining Briley brother, Anthony Ray Briley, currently sixty five years old, been in prison since he was twenty one. Uh, been in prison for murder and rape for over twice as long as he was free before that. He is inmate number 1015001 at the Augusta Correctional Facility in Craigsville, Virginia, a maximum security prison, uh, prison with just over 1,200 inmates. He's one of two of the most notable inmates. He and Monty Rizzle are the most notable, and Monty is a 64-year-old fellow serial killer who raped and killed five women in 1976 and 1977, had raped at least seven other women, and did all of that before the age of 18 when he was apprehended. Been in for 46 years. Man, some people really know how to waste a life, uh, others' lives, and their own. And that will take us out of today's timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. The Briley Brothers. Did anyone else think at any point during this episode... That their name would be like the perfect name for like a circus trapeze act. I think I think it's for me, it's, it's because the name, I kept thinking that. Because the name Briley sounds like a hybrid of Barnum and Bailey. A little bit, right? Barnum and Briley. And decades ago, you know, circuses, they would they would present like trapeze performers as like families. You know, like these amazing uh, brothers or whatever. Just ladies and gentlemen, tonight, performing in the big top for the people of Richmond. Are you ready? For the Flying Briley Brothers! Put your hands together for Anthony Ray, the backflip kid. And make more noise for James Jr., the Robin to tonight's high-flying Batman, the greatest performer the trapeze has ever known, Linwood Briley! Are you ready to be entertained? And maybe robbed? And probably raped? And then be shot at or have your skull crushed by a cinder block or be set on fire? Or treated like your head is a fastball that's just been thrown over the heart of the plate and is about to be knocked out of the park. No safety net tonight, ladies and gents. No death-defying tricks, actually, either. Just Linwood Briley aiming at one of you from the top of the trapeze with a 22 rifle while his Briley brothers run through the crowd and wreak havoc and mayhem. 
Are you not entertained by the flying, no, the bloody Riley Brothers? Thanks for letting me get that out of my system. <laughs> I was thinking about it a lot late, late last night when I was finishing research. Now, uh, how glad are you to not have had Linwood for your older brother or James? Two fucking psychopaths. Did old Boot Riley know how fucked up two of his little brothers were? Is that why he bounced to North Carolina? Did Linwood keep sneaking a, a boa constrictor into his bed at night? Did Linwood try and talk him into shooting a neighbor lady? Did his little brothers, Linwood and James, uh, sometimes, you know, beat the shit out of him when mom and dad weren't home? Was Linwood, or were Linwood and James, uh, you know, why their mom had to go get her own place again, right? What scary shit were they doing at home that no one talked about? I do feel bad for Anthony Briley, the youngest. After Boot bounced, both his older brothers, brothers his dad was so scared of, he started locking his fucking bedroom door with a, a padlock at night. Now they're his primary influences. Two scary motherfuckers he's sharing a home with. Two dudes who would scare both the guards and other inmates on Virginia's death row. I feel like Linwood could have also ended up uh, being a cult leader, right? Maybe the most terrifying cult leader in U.S. history if he would have just focused his dark charisma and power in a slightly different direction. Man, what happened to him? Born evil? Or are there a lot of extra parts of the story that just never became public knowledge? Glad I did not grow up with these guys. Glad I did not grow up anywhere near them. And glad they're either dead or locked up now. In 1984, Linwood and James would go on after their crimes to lead the biggest death row prison escape in U.S. history. Spent two years plotting with accomplices. On the day of their escape, they utilized poor security and a lack of proper protocols to take over the control room, let death row inmates out of their cells in some terrifying situation. Held guards hostage, stole uniforms, pretended they had a bomb to get out of prison. What a wild fucking story. And now let's talk about it just a little bit more with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, unlike many serial killers, the Bradley brothers seem to have had a somewhat normal childhood, minus a few peculiar details, right? They kept exotic pets like snakes, tarantulas, piranhas. Their mom left the family when they were teens, uh, left the boys alone with their dad who padlocked his door every night, likely in fear of them. Uh, although he would say that he didn't know why they became murderers, but uh, maybe he did know and just didn't want to say. And now he'll never say because James Bradley Sr. did die in 2020 at the age of 92. Number two, perhaps the most brutal murder committed by the Bradley crew was their last. The group went to the home of their, their acquaintance, Harvey Wilkerson, a known drug dealer, with the intention to rob him. Or maybe not. Maybe Linwood and co. wanted to uh, have a bloodbath right from the start. Harvey lived with his common-law wife, Judy Barton, who was eight months pregnant, and Judy's young son, and likely his young, young son, Harvey Barton. The Briley's and Meekin uh, entered the uh, house, bound Harvey and Judy, raped Judy several times, and killed the whole fucking family. Judy shot four times. Little Harvey Wayne, his dad, each shot once. The police found the bodies two days later, and the Briley's were arrested the next day, finally bringing to an end their murderous rampage in the city of Richmond. Number three, again, Linwood James led the biggest death row escape in U.S. history. I just found that, I can't believe more. It's, that's not more commonly known. May 31st, 1984, James, Linwood, four more inmates, overpower guards, steal uniforms, pretend a TV is a bomb, and escape a maximum security prison. It was successful. Shockingly, no one was hurt, only because other inmates kept the Briley brothers from raping a nurse and burning some guards alive. And then all inmates recaptured within three weeks. James and Linwood made it out the longest, were arrested in Philadelphia, right? They were caught uh, grilling some chicken in an alley uh, while they were staying at uh, their uncle's house. Bet that dude locked his door at night. I can't feel bad for him for getting in trouble for this situation. I bet he was too scared to tell them that they just couldn't stay with him. Number four, when Linwood Briley was just 16 years old, he committed his first murder, all right, right? Shot a, shot a neighbor lady from his bedroom window who was just you know, working on some laundry. After initially claiming it was an accident that occurred while he was shooting uh, at some birds, he callously said that she had a bar bad heart anyway, right? She was going to die. What's the big deal? What's this big deal? She die soon. I, I help. I help wrestle her a bit into afterlife. I should be give medal. Lynn would serve just one year in juvie for manslaughter for that. And then number five, new info, the cycle of violence repeats. After being captured following their 1984 escape, Linwood and James told uh, the prison chaplain, Sister Eileen Heaps, that they both had kids. Linwood said he had a 10-year-old son named Norman. James had a daughter, never revealed her name. Some accounts say he actually had three daughters. 
Uh, this info was revealed by Sister Heaps during Linwood's baptism on August 2nd. He wanted to be baptized on his son's birthday. In November 2007, the Richmond Times Dispatch talked to Norman Ampey, son of Linwood Briley, uh, who was at that time 33 years old and an inmate at the Riverside Regional Jail in Prince George County. Ampey had been sent to jail repeatedly for drug and robbery charges over the years. Dude uh, didn't have much of a male role model in his life. Ampey said he wasn't told about his dad's execution until the day it happened. He told the paper, I loved my dad. I didn't know that my dad was going to die. And that's what really got to me. I never knew the day was coming. Ampey said his crimes were response to his pain. He said, I had no respect for the law. All I knew was my dad was dead and the police killed him. So that's what I grew up thinking until I got old enough to understand what really happened. That's what I think led me to get in trouble. Ampey wrote in a pre-sentencing report about his crimes that his father's past followed him his whole life. He said in a prison interview, put it this way, man. It seems like I didn't have a shot at being a normal kid with this happening to my father. I've been in trouble since 13, 14 years old, man. I didn't never have a shot at a regular life, you know? Ampey and his younger brothers were raised by their mom, Patricia Lee Ampey. He found school difficult as his dad's crimes became more public. Uh, didn't learn the truth about what really happened until his dad escaped prison in 1984. Ampey wrote, about the time my dad escaped off of death row, people started looking uh, into who my dad was. It made school very hard for me as far as dealing with my peers. Ampey was diagnosed as emotionally disturbed by the school system in seventh grade by the age of 13, already using and selling drugs, and then he dropped out in the ninth grade. When he was 14, he was committed to the Virginia Department of Youth and Family Services, renamed Department of Juvenile Justice, for trespassing and failing to abide by terms of probation. When he was 15, he was charged with possession of cocaine, intent to distribute, and possession of a firearm with cocaine. When he was 16, moved in with his girlfriend. They had a daughter together. In March 1993, at the age of 18, Ampey was sentenced to five years in prison for distrib uh, distributing heroin. At his sentencing, his lawyer acknowledged his juvenile record, but noted that a lot of it stemmed from his involvement with drugs but Ampey had never gone through treatment for drug abuse. The prosecutor argued that his criminal record required a prison term. State counsel advised that he was not amenable to additional treatment because he had consistently demonstrated noncompliance as a juvenile. Ampey wrote, they never gave me a program or a second chance like they did my peers. They all got boot camp. Maybe that could have turned me around. Who knows? Ampey was released on parole a little over two years later. While in prison, he earned a GED, became a certified welder, but said, I've never worked a day in my life. It ain't nothing to be proud of now, you know. In April of 1996, he was charged with capital murder for the robbery and shooting of 22-year-old George Alexander Ross, November 7th, 1995. But then those charges were dropped and never reinstated because a witness balked at testifying against Ampey. Maybe like his dad, he knew how to scare somebody. Two months later, Ampey was attacked by two men outside an East Coast service station on Jefferson Davis Highway, shot repeatedly. His daughter, her mother, and his stepson witnessed the shooting. He believed he was shot in retaliation for the murder. George Alexander Ross's brothers believed Ampey killed George in reprisal for Ross killing Ampey's best friend. And Ampey told the Times Dispatch, I didn't say that I did. I didn't say that I didn't. You know what I mean? I think I do. I think it means that he killed him. Ampey now spent two years recovering at the VCU Medical Center. Two years. He was in a drug-induced coma for six months. Underwent several operations, became addicted to pain meds. Around 2004, his left leg was amputated above the knee because of a shooting-related infection, but he lived and then returned to more crime. January 13th, 2007, Ampey caught robbing a SunTrust bank in Chesterfield, also charged with attempting to rob a pharmacy in Henrico in 2006. Ampey said that he robbed the pharmacy because he had just been released from the hospital after a skin graft operation and was desperate for pain meds. According to Henrico Deputy Commonwealth Attorney, uh, or a attorney, Ampey entered a Kroger pharmacy with two Ford prescriptions for Percocet and Methadone. Pharmacist told him he'd have to wait until Monday so he could verify the prescriptions. He left the store, but then came back 15 minutes later, talked to the pharmacist, talked him into checking out his wounds. Uh, when he was taken into a counseling room now, he cornered her and pulled out a knife and then escaped when she told him she had to get a key to unlock a cabinet and then fled before police got there. And then August 9th, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison with six for suspended uh, or six were suspended for this robbery. And if he blamed the Chesterfield robbery on his mental state at the time, saying the drugs messed me up, man. He was just released from a psychiatric top uh, psychiatric hospital for attempted suicide out of his mind on pain and depression medication. In a statement to the police, he talked about committing a robbery with two patients at the Tucker Pavilion at CJW Medical Center, where he was sent for treatment. After he was discharged, he then met him at a motel in Richmond and planned a robbery. Later told investigators he didn't need the money because he got state settlement from his father's execution. 
I guess he just wanted to fucking rob something. Uh, also received over $2,000 a month in disability, as well as his dad's social security income. The two accomplices waited in the car. He entered the bank in his wheelchair. My God, trying to rob a fucking bank from a wheelchair. Uh, gave the teller a note saying, I have a gun. If you don't do as I demand, I will shoot you. He got $1,400 in cash, but then the dye pack exploded uh, in the parking lot from the cash. And then his accomplices left him in the wheelchair. Just fucking took off. Ampy then went to, this is so fucking sad. This final free month. Ampy then goes to a submarine sandwich shop and just buys a sandwich with one of the stolen $20 bills with fucking ink all over it and just waits for the police to come find him. I hope it was at least a tasty sandwich. April 10th, he sends 25 years, 17 suspended. The accomplices never caught. Prosecutor Tom McKenna said that they uh, could not find the accomplices because Ampy didn't know their names, just knew their street names. Finally, Ampy recalled that during his final visits with his dad, he showed off his drawings to him and said that Linwood cried during their last visit. And then outside when he left, after seeing his dad for the last time, there was a crowd of people supporting his dad's execution. He said a lot of people out there wanted, wanted to kill him, murder him, fry him. I was young at the time. I didn't understand why they were saying that. He told the Times Dispatch about his final call with his father. And he said, uh, his dad said, stand tall, never fall. Don't let no one tell you you can't do something. And then Norman Ampy died April 3rd, 2015. Uh, I feel bad he had to grow up without a dad. But had Linwood actually been around, would his life have been better? Or as sad as his life was, would it have been so, so much worse? Time suck. Top five takeaways. The bloody Briley brothers have been sucked. Uh, thank you to Olivia Lee for the initial research on this one. Thanks to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., recording, editing this episode. So you can watch it on uh, YouTube in addition to listening if you want. Also, you can watch uh, Trying to Get Better out now on YouTube, the stand-up special. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we get bloody again. We get brutal again. We get in situations where people were trapped in coffin-sized boxes for years at a time and savagely tortured. But we're not sticking with true crime. No, we're heading to the Korean War. The conflict that lasted between 1950 and 1953 took place on the underdeveloped and until just then colonized Korean Peninsula in Eastern Asia. And uh, But though in a remote corner of the world and not very long, the Korean War would leave its mark on history and global politics. Uh, just a few weeks ago, on August 22nd, the U.S. State Department renewed its ban on the use of U.S. passports for travel to North Korea. The ban first set in place by the Trump administration in 2017, been renewed annually since. And that could have never happened without the Korean War because the Korean War is what turned Korea into North and South Korea. A hundred years ago, Koreans dreamed of a united Korea, a Korea that wasn't ruled by imperialist Japan, which had annexed it in 1910, a Korea in which there would be a government run by Koreans for Koreans, but then that didn't happen. Instead, the U.S. and Soviet Russia hashed out a plan for what to do with newly independent Korea post-World War II, and the one-time allies, allies suddenly found themselves in a state of extreme tension, kickoff of the Cold War. Russia poured its troops and money into North Korea, intent on establishing a communist ally, the U.S., meanwhile, scrambled to unite a politically fragmented South Korea. The two were separated, temporarily, everyone hoped, along the 38th parallel. But soon North Korea, backed by Russia and later China, would start making a plan. A plan to invade South Korea, capture Seoul, and turn the entire country communist. And on June 25th, 1950, that plan would kick off. And the Korean War would begin, and we suck it next week on Time Suck. Right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Uh, this week's first update, short and funny, and courtesy of someone creating their own Cummins Law situation outside of the podcast. Uh, super sucker Jeremy Ward writes, Master Sucker, this is a situation where I created a Cummins Law event with my own mouth. Due to my brain not thinking it through before the words came out. My 11-year-old daughter, who loves princesses, was at my house watching Disney Plus and had settled upon a Nat Geo show about Cleopatra. I was juggling, trying to cook brunch, clean up after a Nerf gun battle, and pay attention to her. I did not hear specifically what the show said, but it apparently referred to something regarding Ptolemy intermarriage. My daughter asks, so they marry people in their own family? And then in a father of the year performance, out of my mouth comes, yeah, they're all a bunch of cousin fuckers. Oops. I thank you so much for introducing that term to my brain to slip out to my daughter in a moment of distraction. Very classy father moment. Jeremy. Well, Jeremy, um, you know, maybe it was time that she learned some real history. Although technically, you should have said sister fucker or maybe sibling fucker. But I guess, especially if you have other kids, you know, that, that could have made that moment so much worse. Uh, and also, 
Maybe cousin fucker is more fun to say. Uh, you should try and save some face and tell her that a lot of great people have been cousin fuckers. Uh, even Einstein. Next up, cool sucker. Allie Ewing Bradshaw has like a badass aunt and shit. And she got excited about her relation to her our, our charity this month, Project Mori. And Allie writes, holy shit balls. Listening to the new suck on the trailside killer and the charity was announced. I literally screamed, no shit. <laughs> As Project Mori slash Mori's camp is my second home. My aunt, Don Ewing, has been the executive director for 20 plus years. So I grew up visiting camp for a few days during my summers and fell in love. It's a safe place where kids from difficult backgrounds learn that there are good people in this world who want them to succeed. My love turned into me working there for four summers with the same group of kids. I started with them when they were 12. Then worked on the weekends with my kids during their school year program until they graduated high school. Some of my campers are now lawyers, NICU nurses. Uh, Some even went to work there as alumni staff. That place creates good human beings that we all know this world needs more of. My campers learned what a network of support was, how to gain self-esteem, how to support others, how to take care of one another. I have chills writing this and I just want to thank you all the bad magic. You have no idea what the donation means to me personally and how many kids it will impact. My aunt has influenced and motivated me my entire life through Project Mori and I'm proud to say I work for a nonprofit in upstate New York and Project Mori is a huge part of who I am today. Can't wait to see you in Buffalo, Dan. My husband and I are massive fans of both Time Suck and Scared to Death. Proud to support podcasts and do good for this odd world. My husband is like your biggest fan. So a shout out to Otis Bradshaw. Would be dope. Uh, we just got married in July and actually watched your new stand-up special while on our honeymoon in Punta Cana. Hail Nimrod. Thanks for all you do for so many. Ali Ewing Bradshaw. Well, Ali, congrats on getting married to Otis. I heard he has a huge cock. Like way fucking, like way too big for an adult novelty, novelty keychain. That's, that's the word on the street about his meat. I had not heard of Punta... Canna, uh, if that's how you say it before, but looking at some pics, I'm jealous. That part of the Dominican Republic looks beautiful. So cool about your aunt. Uh, so cool about the connection to Project Mori. Right? We're excited to help some kids out. Thanks to our Patreon supporters. Love it. Uh, you know, did did make me think of Ampy. It's like, man, if a kid like that could have been given this opportunity, maybe his life would have turned out so different. Not so sure about Linwood, but maybe Linwood too. Hail Nimrod and see you in Buffalo. Next up, we all need to watch out for confirmed devil worshiper. Christina Bentley, that sneaky Southpaw Sidewinder uh, shares the following. Hello, Master Sucker. I was listening to the recent Trailside Killer Suck when you mentioned being left-handed was historically considered a sign of the devil. (laughs) Well, I just had to write in to tell you about the time my sinful Southpaw caused an end to a budding relationship. A girl I was becoming friends with back in high school made the tragic discovery. (laughs) This is so fucking crazy the way people think. And I remember her grimacing. And saying, oh, you're left-handed? You're going to go to hell. <laughs> to which I replied, well, I sold my soul to the devil. So, duh. Uh, so, it's like, she was kidding. And then she goes, she avoided eye contact with me the next day. I later found out she was pretty religious. And while at the time I was upset and thought it was really dumb, I, not, I now find it hilarious, but still dumb. Thanks for reading and keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> hail Satan and hail Nimrod, Christina. Well, Christina, I have five words for you. You know who also was left-handed? I'm not even joking. My dad. Kind of fits, doesn't it? Uh, but seriously, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing for people to believe that left-handed people are just going to hell. Uh, glad you uh, messed with her a little bit. And now uh, for another goofy message, funny sack <laughs> guy green points out my absurd level of hypocrisy with the following short message. So severed human body parts are cool on keychains, but sex toys? Or too much for your liking? I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. The older I get, the less sense the world makes. Three out of five, suck on. <laughs> that short message killed me, guy. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks to uh, Scared to Death, uh, we do sell novelty severed body part keychains in the Bad Magic store, which I guess are probably fucking weirder than sex toy keychains. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Well, thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death. Time suck each week. If you're listening from death row this week and inspired to make a break for it, probably not going to happen. The last death row inmate to escape was Martin uh, 
Guruli in 1998, broke out in Texas, but as he escaped, got shot in the neck as he scaled over the last fence. And later that night, weakened from blood loss, he, he drowned in a river. Should have stayed in a cell and probably just kept on sucking. Mad Magic Productions. Anyone else love the uh, the classic circus uh, theme song? That always gets me all pumped up. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this weird chapter of the book of the Bad Magic Productions. History, conspiracy, killers, oh my! Fucked up jokes, but also quite a bit of heart. Sometimes some mental health advice. Oftentimes a lot of dark shit that might not be so good for your mental health. <laughs> How does this work at all? Am I some kind of dark wizard? Did I learn spells from lost scrolls from the Library of Alexandria? Is anyone even still listening anymore or just annoyed and waiting for the next podcast in their queue to begin playing? Why am I still talking? I really think I'm done now. Time to check in with the bearded lady. Does the carpet match the beard? I guess I could have left that one out. Probably should have stopped 10 seconds ago, at least. Okay, I'm really done.